This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Can I uh, welcome members to our, our second meeting of the Education Committee? Uh, advise members of the public gallery that they are welcome to use. Should I wait until there are members of the public no, gallery? I'm not sure. Thank <laughs> um, you. Okay. Um, well, for the benefit of those in the public gallery, um, I advise them that they are welcome to use mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Uh, there is assembly Wi-Fi available, password details are available on the gallery rules and it is not permitted to take uh, photographs or record any of our meeting without prior permission. Okay, members, uh, anyone aware of any apologies? I know that uh, Robbie Butler, MLA, has advised that he will be late arriving this morning. Clark, any other apologies? No? No. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I have to yes, Daniel. No problem. I've, I've noted those issues as well. No problem. Thank Nothing. you. Thanks. Okay, members. Agenda item two then is chairperson's business, and uh, in relation to an informal meeting with the teaching unions on Tuesday, the twentieth of January, twenty twenty, uh, we had a, a constructive engagement with the teaching unions. I'm sure members will agree. Uh, the unions advised of key issues underpinning the teachers' pay and conditions dispute. Uh, the union advised that a, an agreement in principle has been reached with the department and employers uh, in June of 2019. Uh, outlined the estimated cost uh, of that agreement being approximately £68 million and advised the committee in relation to uh, a an outstanding business case with the Department of Finance uh, that is required before the Department of Education can make progress on that matter um, and also advise the committee members of further work that is scheduled to address wider uh, changes to uh, teachers' pay and conditions and indeed to stabilise and improve education across Northern Ireland. Um, can I also uh, advise members that the committee agreed at its last meeting to meet informally with the Education Authority Board on Thursday the 29th of January 2020 at noon in its Antrim facilities and the informal meeting will conclude at 1.30pm if members are able to confirm that they will attend with the clerk and a, a small briefing pack has been provided for that meeting. Okay, members, um, any comments in relation to those matters? Or happy to proceed, yeah. Okay. Agenda item three, then, is our draft minutes there of the meeting of 22nd of January 2020. They're available at page six, tab one. And can I seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed, thank you. Okay, agenda item four, matters arising. I can advise members that there are no matters arising. Um, yeah, and here, so. okay, yeah. So, um, um, that's great. Agenda item five then is our <coughs> ministerial briefing um, on his <coughs> educational priorities. I can refer members to a briefing paper from the clerk at page 15, tab two, uh, and a departmental <coughs> briefing paper at page 39, tab three. Uh, I would advise members uh, that table items which include papers from the Department of Education and correspondence from the teaching unions uh, are also available and advise members that the session will be recorded by Hansard. Um, can I therefore give uh, the Minister uh, for Education, Peter Rear, MLA, and Permanent Secretary Derek Baker a, a very warm welcome. Uh, Minister, you and the Permanent Secretary are, are very welcome to the second meeting of the Committee for Education. I think it's almost three years to the day uh, since we were at this uh, place um, facing each other. Um, so I'm glad uh, we're able to welcome you back. Um, there are obviously a, a wide range of serious challenges facing education that we need to, to which we need to respond urgently and decisive. So we look forward to hearing your opening statement uh, today and then uh, to take questions from committee members. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. I mean, I was watching, I think, last night a programme on Europe, which I saw Tony Blair interviewed, and they were contrasting, if you like, whenever he had came into office, a certain level of honeymoon period, obviously Tony Blair... Uh, very much associated with the phrase of the priorities of education, education, education. 
So if the parallel is to be, I know we're coming in with a sort of a certain level of uh, good spirit and, and good faith, which means probably about half of you in about six months' time will hit the side of me uh, at some stage. But in six, any event, like, six months. Six months. <laughs> well, a spirit of optimism. So I'm pushing the boat out in terms of time frame on that basis. Can I first of all um, say I'm welcome the opportunity to be in front of the committee so early? Uh, obviously. Uh, the original intention was to be here last week, but with the executive away day, um, sort of put paid to that. Uh, and from that point of view also, um, from both the, myself and the department, we'll be very open to whatever is being sought, indeed any appearances. I know um, after both myself and the permanent secretary here, you'll have a number of senior officials who'll be able to, I suppose you'll be able to drill down on some of the, the, the detailed issues where they have uh, particular um, expertise and experience. Uh, it's also the case that in terms of any papers or information that you need, we'll be, again, happy to facilitate. I, I suppose the only thing I would say would be the more notice that we get in terms of, uh, in terms of papers, the easier it is for us to um, supply those. Uh, can I say, obviously, I feel that um, commonly I think we share uh, a view of the importance of education uh, within, uh, I suppose, not just Northern Ireland government, but for everyone in Northern Ireland. Um, and while we can highlight, I suppose, the, the positive impact that good education has on communities, on society, and obviously it's a key driver in terms of the economy, uh, to my mind the most important thing with education is the, the impact on the individual. Because I think that education can be the great life enabler, it can be the great game changer for an individual, um, and that should be our key focus. I mean, within the programme for government, it talks about... Uh, ensuring that, that every child is given the, the best possible start in life. Uh, and I suppose one of the things which, uh, you know, there's important elements of detail and there will be big issues that, that the collective will, will be tackling from teacher pay to um, school finance to, you know, a whole myriad of issues. But I suppose in one sense we remember that, that all the issues are ultimately a means to an end, which is actually providing that support for our young people. Now, Obviously, from the point of view of the department, uh, and I'm, I know you've had, I'm sure, a briefing on this, um, there's obviously a wide range of responsibilities and scope of the department. Focus is always quite clearly, and particularly in the public's mind, on purely, if you like, the school system. Um, we run for mainstream schools up to 18, for special um, educational provision up to 19. Uh, but I think we should also remember that within the scope of the responsibilities, since the change of about four or five years ago, Obviously, the um, department will also be responsible for early years education. It will be responsible for, um, I suppose, youth, uh, the youth side of things. And we'll be working alongside others and also will have responsibility, particularly for childcare provision. So, uh, you know, it's about, suppose, getting the, the full scene up. In terms of the issues that are coming up, um, I want to touch on a few just briefly. Um, it is hard because I think the elephant in the room consistently, particularly on a lot of the big issues that are facing us, is that of resources. Um, and that will mean, depending upon where we end up with the resources, either that um, things can be quite manageable, doable, or alternatively we could be in very tough territory, depending upon the level of resources. Now, principally here, and I know um, you will have Philip Irwin up later and John Smith as regards the Strule situation. Um, I'll touch briefly on the issue of capital before we move on to resources uh, and the um, recurrent resources. In, in terms of capital, look, there's no doubt that if you are um, going out there within the sector, could you, you know, and there was unlimited capability and unlimited amount of money, um, you know, could the capital budget be spent two times over, three times over? Yes, certainly it, it could. However, what I would say in, in the broad level, compared, I suppose, with the, the pressures on the recurrent budget, uh, I still feel we're in a better position as regards to the, the capital budget. This year, the capital budget uh, in terms of mainstream spend is £157 million, and there's also then that ongoing issue uh, as regards fresh start money which uh, for integrated and shared uh, campuses. Um, and I suppose where we are, particularly in terms of the main budget, there can be a, fair, a considerable level of confidence that the main capital budget uh, will move along at probably at least a similar pace um, I suspect, given what has been said nationally in terms of infrastructure, that the Prime Minister is likely to uh, embrace higher levels of spend on capital, 
which will have some level of, of knock-on effect uh, for us. So, uh, and there are both limitations in Northern Ireland about precisely what can be spent because you're dependent upon, um, if you like, what various professional bodies can do in terms of uh, development plans, in terms of construction. So there will be a little bit of a natural limit. As such, I think we are fairly confident that uh, while we can always spend more money, that we'll be able to keep a, a flow of, of capital projects. And one advantage uh, that we would have that in terms of the main capital budget, I don't think we've been at any stage in terms of the main capital budget where it's unrestricted, um, been in any way not drawing down what we've um, asked for or indeed been able to spend, is that we have a mix of, of capital projects. So there will be major capital works in which there's likely to be a call uh, made in relation to that at some stage. Uh, and the, also, as we saw uh, from a couple of weeks ago, school enhancement programme, which has been very successful in a range of schools and has the advantage of it can be delivered at a, a quicker rate than, um, uh, than the major capital programme. And also there's minor works programmes. And to some extent, if there is therefore any problems within the system in terms of any spend, there can be a little bit of switching about from year to the year with those various programmes. Uh, so it means, therefore, we're in a good position to absorb um, the, the capital money. So from that point of view, I'm not saying, again, if, if, if the executive was to decide to put more money into capital in, in education, uh, and I need to also make sure that, that we spend that very strategically, could more be spent? Yes, I think more could be spent. Uh, but in terms of the, sh the elements of pressures, it, it's maybe less than it would be on the broader resource side of it. On the resource side, I suppose, maybe to touch on four major issues. Uh, first of all, uh, there has been for school budgets uh, considerable pressure in recent years. Uh, I think across the education sector, uh, if we take sort of what is, I suppose generally speaking, a historic high point of spend of 2010-2011. Uh, in real terms, we're around about £230 million of a gap if we'd, we'd kept pace with inflation. Now, uh, particularly for schools, um, we're in a situation where schools in recent years have very much worn her shirts. They've been in a situation where they've, they've made cuts. And despite that, and it has been highlighted very clearly by, uh, by schools, that even with doing that, schools are not in a position to make ends meet. That is a result in the last number of years. We have seen that the, the drawdown in terms of deficits increasing, surpluses coming down, uh, there has tended to be an overspend of 20, 30, perhaps more million, because essentially schools are not able to cope uh, within budgets. And uh, the purpose, I think, even in terms of the monitoring round, will be able to apply a little bit of money to try and ensure, because essentially that is filling uh, salaries for, for teachers. Uh, I should say as well, the other thing that schools have a difficulty <coughs> with is they have a very limited room for manoeuvre which is that for schools, roughly speaking, 80% plus of their budgets will go directly on teacher salaries. It's well over 90% of general salaries. So you know, there isn't a great deal of ways that they can make some level of, of savings within the school without ultimately leading to some form of redundancies, which is something we don't want to be able to see. There is a need in terms of where we are, and uh, although we don't have the final figure, we anticipate that the... Um, the amount of expenditure beyond what was allocated in the ASB uh, will be greater this year than it has been in previous years. Um, you know, that will not be something, even if we get a, a generous budget settlement, that will be solved overnight. So it's a question of starting to close the gap on that. That's one critical issue. Obviously something which is very much in people's mind and another key priority uh, is that of paying conditions, and particularly as regards the, um, the teacher's pay settlement. Where we are with that, and I think it's been fairly well <coughs> publicly documented, uh, there has been, from the summer of last year, effectively um, a, an agreement between management side and teacher unions on the period between 2017 to 2019 um, to take things up to the 1st of September. Uh, there is a case which has been put into the Department of Finance in relation to that. Uh, we have, I suppose, to use a, a Borisism, sort of an oven-ready deal that is, is there. The, the key factor, and to be fair, again, it's not through any lack of desire from the Department of Finance, is actually securing the funding for that. And particularly as the bulk of that money will be on the basis that will impact on baselines, 
it's not just a question of getting a one-off amount of money. It's the fact of how that will impact in and getting that security for that. But I am very much focused in on trying to uh, resolve that issue. Indeed, I'll be meeting with uh, the unions this afternoon. I, I should say, because it's sometimes not always um, realised, that that deal goes beyond simply the issue of pay. Um, and there are, as part of that, uh, agreements to have a number of work streams <coughs> on issues such as um, workload that the teachers face, administration, inspection, uh, on issues around substitute costs, which there may be some opportunities uh, to make changes there, and issues around sort of flexibility of movement of staff where there's redundancies. So there's a range of those, some of which I think will produce very virtuous results if we can, uh, we can do that. The other issue, I suppose, just whenever we're talking about pay, well, the focus has been on the, the pay settlement to end industrial action. One of the very major pressures within the system is because we're talking about an agreement which is to cover the 17 to 19 period. If we're looking at in year up to 2021 on teacher pay, ultimately we're looking at what can be done effectively over what is a more or less a three and a half year period. Mm -hmm. So that means particularly in terms of the overall uplift that will be there, uh, there's a very major issues to be decided there. And I suppose the final point I would make in terms of pay um, is that while the focus is always on teacher pay, um, one area where there isn't a great deal of discretion from the point of view of the department, um, there is on non-teacher pay. A lot of that is decided by way of national settlements through NJC. Uh, those have tended to be at a higher rate than, than inflation in, in recent years. But if there's a national agreement to pay particular classes of workers, often who are quite relatively low paid to start off with, to pay a particular pay increase, uh, there isn't any variation really that either up or down that the department can do <clears throat> in relation to it. Third issue obviously is strategically that of um, special needs. Uh, now, in particular, I suppose two things to highlight in connection with that. We've seen a um, growing number of pupils, and again, for quite often a range of very virtuous reasons, uh, who it's been realised that there are that they will have some form of special needs, and indeed, um, in about 18,000 cases, um, have been statemented. Uh, the framework for support for those people. Now, first of all, I think in terms of the, I think we have a little bit of a vicious cycle at present, which is that each year, because of the additional um, numbers that are that are increasing, we're seeing a fairly rapid rise in recent years in terms of the the budgetary pressures on that. My sense of things is that this, this is not accompanied by a belief from parents that the things are necessarily getting better. So we need to see what we can do to actually improve that situation. One of the things which has been a level of overhang from a number of years, which will be then going out to make sort of a bit of a step change in terms of uh, special educational needs. Um, like roughly five years ago, the special educational needs bill went through the assembly under John O'Dowd. Arising out of that were due to be uh, regulations which need to pass through the Assembly and a code of practice. Uh, it would be our intention, and that would provide a, a support framework and make some changes, put those into effect. Uh, those have been cleared, I think, with departmental solicitors um, around about December. Uh, they're ready, I think, fairly soon to go out to consultation. Uh, the one point I would highlight is that, that uh, when those are put into place for schools, uh, that will create in and of itself additional responsibilities and pressures. I think to the extent that, that we feel that there will need to be a level of additional funding, because there will be a level of additional funding given to schools to be able to, to cope with that. And I suppose the fourth point just I want to make just in terms of um, issues around sort of big ticket items, uh, is that a childcare, uh, and obviously as part of that is a commitment to expand the childcare provision. Northern Ireland, we would have the lowest level of, of provision in terms of free childcare in the year before uh, school. Now, they, there are different models which, uh, and one of them will be put as a, as a proposal ultimately to the executive to expand that up to a 30 hour provision. Uh, I should say as well, there are also, while the focus is always on the 30 hours for the year below school, there are other implications both of school aged children and indeed through Bright Start with uh, some of the, the issues around uh, younger children. Uh, what I would 
caution again, that is also, all these items that I've mentioned are very big ticket items in terms of cost. The other issue I suppose I'm uh, conscious of with, with childcare, uh, whatever model has gone down will lead to considerable expansion, particularly in terms of the amount of hours across the board that the nursery provision can be made. Leaving aside the finance aspect, there will be a need to build up capacity within the sector. So even if this was something for the sake of argument, it was put to the executive next week and agreed, this will take a, a reasonable period of time to build up to that, that point. And there will therefore be issues around parental expectation. Now, allied, I suppose, with resources is the issue, because I think uh, there's an interlink with a, a level of reform. Uh, very specifically within the, the new decade uh, document, <clears throat> there are two aspects where um, there is particular focus on form. One is a commission that will look at overall reform of the system, particularly to drive effectiveness and efficiency, uh, and a second very specifically targeted particularly at, at underachievement. I would say the one advantage we have, uh, financially those are things which are not, uh, the two commissions will not be big ticket items in terms of, in terms of cost, um, and the other advantage we have with both uh, will be that we're not starting from a point of zero. On underachievement, there have been down the years a number of reports on underachievement, uh, and I suppose there would be a particular focus whenever we get to the point of that on, on how we can actually implement things, how we can produce best practice, but there's a lot of good things happening out there in terms of underachievement, particularly in, in early years, and one of the things that I think we find very successful within schools, which are nurture units. Similarly, on the broader issue of reform, uh, the department, while obviously in the absence of devolution, there has been a, a major restriction on, on broad policy context, um, is in sort of engaged with EA and other organisations in a range of work streams uh, that have looked at transformation um, and are gradually, if you like, building up information around that. Look, there would be a number of issues, I think, how we have a more cohesive system in terms of what we provide in terms of um, the school system. Uh, there is obviously a need, uh, again, without prejudging any of the solutions within that, around the, the I suppose, turbocharge area planning, which at times, while there has been, and to be fair, one of the advantages has been that the, the Permanent Secretary has been able to take development decisions, the pipeline of, of development proposals coming forward has been limited, and I think we need to see that, that moving more quickly. There are issues around the mixture of the workforce, um, around how we have best intervention. So there's a range of things that, that uh, those bodies, and I'll be looking to bring forward proposals first to the executive and then wider within that. I suppose the only issue I would put is a little bit of a caveat to that. Um, it's important that reform moves alongside finance. Reform in and of itself is not the golden ticket to solve our financial difficulties. A lot of the reforms that are needed, even particularly around area planning, will be less about massive amounts that are saved, but more about actually improving the quality of, of education. Uh, and that's particularly true in area planning. Uh, if we look at the broader level of efficiency, yes, there are things that can be done more efficiently, provision that can be made. We have at the moment, when you include nursery, about 340,000 pupils within the schools system. Uh, that in terms of numbers is roughly about 17,000 more than it was a few years ago. Uh, and indeed, next year, those figures are due to increase uh, yet again. Demographics uh, have increased in that level. However efficient we get at the moment, we have roughly about 18,500 full-time equivalent teachers. Uh, it is unrealistic to say that if even if we move to more efficient, that we're going to see a massive difference in terms of the numbers of, of teachers. We still need a large number of teachers to be able to, to teach. And similarly, even where we see there are virtuous things that can happen the nature of education, sometimes it will take a, a level of time and sometimes require legislative provision to be able to turn some of those things around. Final point just I want to touch on is that there also is a recognition, which is critical in any form of joined up government, uh, that a number of the challenges that we will face will require cross-sectoral solutions. Uh, principally, if we look at areas around how we ensure that we get the best out of um, uh, of early years. There's a clear crossover with, with health, because particularly if we're talking about, and a lot, of the, a lot of the difficulties we have around underachievement is actually happens before the child even gets through the school gates in the first place. And particularly with health visitors being the, the, uh, the principal point of contact with most families, there's work that needs to be done 
with health in relation to that. And I suppose we're working to ensure that, particularly the Children's and Young People's Cooperation Act, um, that it's important that, that that filters down at very much at a grassroots level. It's not just something which, which is decided at a higher level. But similarly on health, there are cross-sectoral issues on, um, on SEN. Um, similarly on mental health, and I, I should say also in terms of mental health, it's important to note that while there are vital issues around children's mental health, in doing that there is also, I think, a job of work to be done uh, for the staff within, within schools. Um, and indeed they will face, and we've seen probably some of the stresses, particularly in some areas with the chances of suicide, and you know, we've got to realise that that has a major impact on the wider school community, so people can't be ignored on that side of things. And as most finally in terms of cross-sectoral that I want to highlight, there's also a key job of work, which again, there's been some background work has been done uh, between ourselves and the Department of Economy to ensure that we have a 14 to 19 strategy that is fit for purpose. And part of that also will involve the interaction between particularly, say, sixth form centres, between what schools provide and what is there in terms of further <coughs> higher education. There's not always that, that match of opportunities. And we're seeing sometimes sometimes driven by choice, but whether students are always in the location that is best for them in terms of uh, the pathway that, that they can take, I think is something we need to examine. So that is just a, a quick run through of a number of the, the issues. I, I am sure there'll be many and varied um, questions. And if there's anything too difficult, um, I'll be passing it over to the Permanent Secretary on that basis. <laughs> uh, I see him glancing behind him to see then uh, which officials he can then delegate at later stages. Obviously, there'll be items of detail I know you'll be pursuing up with some of the other officials at, at a later stage as well. But I'm open to whatever you want to ask. OK. Well, thanks very much indeed, Minister. It, uh, it is um, important uh, to have you, you back in your position, and, and we welcome that. And a lot of the issues that you've set out are consistent with the initial key priorities and forward work programme that this committee has set as well. Um, if we can get uh, serious for uh, this part of the um, exchange and our, our questions, so, as you've rightly acknowledged, there are many very serious challenges facing education. Um, you have referenced um, to the extent that our, our teaching and non-teaching staff have been on industrial action for a number of years and achieving fair pay and conditions for teaching and non-teaching staff will be an absolute priority for this committee as well. You, you mentioned special educational needs provision which as we know is failing to meet the needs of too many children and is also failing to provide teachers with the support that they need. Um, to the extent that we have had problems up to and including allegations of the use of inappropriate restraint and seclusion on occasion. As you've mentioned, school budgets are at breaking point for many schools. I understand the Department of Education itself is overspent. The Education Authority has declared a financial crisis in education and assessments of the cost of separation in education continue to be approximately up to £100 million per year. We also continue to have a current approach to post-primary transfer that is consistently challenged by much academic research and yet an area planning process that is failing to deliver reform at the pace necessary to deliver a more sustainable and integrated education system. That all to the extent that the outgoing Education Authority CEO over two years ago now said that without radical investment and radical reform, our education system could be unaffordable, socially immobile and unfit for the 21st century. So my first question, Minister, would be what specific radical reforms and radical investment will you action to respond to this crisis? Well, OK, deal with a few of those points. Um, I, first of all, just on a point of clarification on one point, teaching staff have been in industrial action, non-teaching staff haven't been on that, on that basis, okay. well, there's a little bit of occasional um, impact on that, on that side of things. And particularly while a lot of non-teaching staff quite often are in low-paid jobs, the, the, the levels of pay increase for non-teaching staff have tended maybe to be in around about 4% uh, in a number of the years. And, and so consequently, there isn't the direct same, same problem. But clearly in terms of industrial action, we want to uh, deal with that. In terms of the, the radical bit, now, uh, maybe dealing first of all with the finance side of it, first of all, uh, there needs to be a step change 
we would estimate of probably several, I mean, they don't precisely quantify it, you can vary the figures, certainly several hundred million, maybe some in the region of about three to four hundred million at least, uh, that would need to be increased in terms of the budget. You're saying, what can I do about that? Principally, uh, the key to that is getting additional finance in via the executive. Now, there will be, the issue to my mind is that, that be it through mention of packages, Barnet consequentials, the overall executive budget, even taken at the most pessimistic, will be have a considerable increase next year. Uh, the issue is, I think, from all the departments, what they are seeking is well beyond what is potentially there. So it's how much of that cake that, that we get. But there is no, I mean, when I mentioned about, for instance, those four big ticket items, we are estimating in terms of pay roughly about 150 million may be needed to cover all those aspects in terms of pay, not just the settlement, but if we're looking at potentially what could be uh, settlements for 1920, 2021, and for the non-teaching side of it, um, on special needs, um, you know, you may be looking across the, the board of all those around about 75 million. Uh, school budgets to essentially get it to a point where uh, the head is above water. Ideally, we'd need at least probably 50, 60 million on that side of things. Uh, although it will not be impacted on year one in terms of childcare, if we were to move to 30 hours, that would probably end up, well, there's a range of variables in terms of what model is used. But you're talking about anywhere from 40 to 90 million pounds per year, uh, depending upon which particular formula you go for in relation to that. So now, I should say the only caveat that the child carries would be impossible to spend that sort of money in, in year one. So you're looking at a more modest figure. All those are very, very big ticket items. And realistically, whatever changes that are able to be made in um, in terms of pressures within the, the within the department would not come close to sort of, you can do absolutely all the reforms you want in the world and it will not come anywhere close to filling that level of gap. I think in terms of reforms, um, mentioned particularly has been made, a lot of the things that, that do need to be done in the broader sense, in a lot of cases, some of them are already being done, some of them are in hand in terms of transformation. Uh, however, <coughs> it's I suppose, also about ratcheting those. In area planning, there has been at times too slow a process. I think there's maybe been sensitivity around making difficult decisions. Uh, with the end result that the flow of activity in terms of area planning uh, has not been as swift as it, it should be. There has been, I still think, a lack of cohesion between the different sectors. And I think we need to see at the very least uh, a good deal of both in terms of the schools, the state and generally a lot more of a joined up approach between those, those different sectors. I would say in terms of the, some of the specifics of that, um, in terms of, um, we can debate some of the figures in terms of, of separation. What is often the case in terms of efficiency of provision? There will be some cases where you get divided provision between different sectors in an area. Possibly in an overall global point of view, the bigger problem will quite often be over provision within a sector within an area where you get a number of schools very close to each other. But I should also say with all those things, that is not enough itself going to make a big cost saving. Some of that will be more about the quality of education. So if you've got a post primary school that ultimately is too small, it cannot, um, often it is not able to provide the, the breadth of subjects, particularly at GCSE, uh, to give all the opportunities it can to its pupils. Similarly, uh, for some very small schools at the primary school side of it, whereas the, the, there is evidence that there's very little difference between a composite class where it's over two years or a single year. Once you move beyond that into a three-year composite class, then there is a degree of detriment to the level of, I think, of education potentially that, that can be provided. Uh, so it's about a cochlear measure. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that, that uh, as part of that as well, uh, will want to, uh, there will be an independent commission task. So to that point of view, I, while it may well be for a lot of us in education fairly obvious about the direction of travel and the range of those things, I can't circumscribe what that is going to produce. So in one sense, I, I can't produce the solution before I've set up the, the commission to, to look at that. But those are the sort of the type of areas that, that, that we've got. I mean, I know there are other issues you raised within that um, around, uh, you know, 
broad sustainability. I'd, I'd be happy to pick up any specifics that, that I've missed out. Okay. They're obviously significant figures in terms of the extent of the finance that will be needed to respond to the actions that you want to take forward to improve our education system um, and a concerning lack of detail with regards to what reform action can be taken by the department but you did mention the well the, the, the issue the issue but i mean just, just sorry i just want to say no, but give, to give, give, just one example right. in terms of things there are things for instance that can be done that will impact potentially on workplace planning the the issue i suppose as well and again just want to put a caveat <coughs> to this things can be put in for instance that will create more flexibility of, of movement in terms of teachers where there are redundancies things can be put in in terms of there's a high cost of substitution cover and that can be reduced as well. If you're looking at some of those things, those will require regulations. The ability for those to be brought through to have any level of impact at all at the earliest before, say, the autumn or 2021. I'm just saying that in terms of the broad impact on finances, a range of things that can be done and will be done, and I will be in as imaginative as, as possible with that. Okay. If people think there will be quick fix solutions or quick fix impacts, then I think collectively we're going to make, we need to make sure that there's a bit of reality around that as well okay well look we, we can come back to those figures and, mm -hmm. and the actions that are needed you did to be fair to you mention the independent review of mm -hmm. education um, can you give a, a time scale with regards to when you well, uh, I mean, implementing that I think <coughs> you'll be looking at something fairly quickly I want to give a little a little bit of thought to precisely how that is set up there'll be terms of reference will be brought forward to the the executive it will be, I think, within the next few months that that, that will be, be brought forward. There's no reason to delay. What I would say is it is also the case um, where there are reforms can happen, where there's anything which at least can be started before that, that body concludes, it is not a question of, within the system, of us waiting necessarily on every response we get out of the, the Commission. So if there's issues around, you know, we're not, for instance... <coughs> If you take the area of area planning, it is clear that there needs to be a step change in what happens in terms of area planning, in terms of, in terms of speed. It will not be a question of things being put on hold until we get that. Where, where there are things that, that can happen and should happen, uh, there will be action taken to progress those as quickly as, as possible. Okay. Uh, just two very short, specific uh, questions for you, Minister. I've mentioned that teacher pay and conditions will obviously be a priority for our committee and mm -hmm. special education needs provision as well. So uh, in terms of the teacher's pay and condition, can, can you give us clarity around the status of the business case for the pay settlement? Has that been approved? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, the amount of finance and needed and, and where that finance well, will come from? OK, directly speaking... Uh, the business case has been submitted to DOF. I think the only barrier, because again, I don't, I mean, and I, I would praise all those involved with the discussions around that, both management side, the trade union side, I think there is a reasonable compromise that is there. Um, the one barrier is essentially the money being av available. I don't think there's per se any particular difficulties with the business case itself in that, in that regard. What we're talking about very specifically on that bit is around about 68 million of a gap. Uh, but then there are two other aspects to the overall pay bill. There will be then where we reach, uh, and there'll need to be discussions that cover the post-2019 period and whatever then is put in place financially for that, for teachers, <laughs> and also then the costs, uh, particularly for 2021, for non-teachers. So, um, and the estimate is for the vast bulk of that 68 million. There, there is some other money which is set aside the overall amount, I suppose, it would cost on a teacher, we estimate around a, bit, a little bit over 100 million. There is some money that is, is kind of waiting, that's always accrued, that can be applied to that. Uh, I would say of that 100 million, roughly half will, will end up being effectively baselined and half is, is largely speaking back pay. But there's no point in being able to announce we've reached a settlement until there's actually the money to pay for it. And it's not just a question of here's a one-off payment. It's getting the assurance that this will actually be baseline for future years. Okay. Chair, can I? <coughs> well, the, the, the key, I'm constantly to get the members' questions as well. So the key question is, where is that money coming from, mm -hmm. and is it coming quickly enough yeah. that you're going to be able to avoid any further escalation of industrial the action, money, such money, as strike action? The money can only come <coughs> from an increase in the department's budget, because the scale of those sort of changes, and that will, will stand or fall on the budgetary settlement, particularly for 
2021. I know that I think the time scales from the Department of Finance is that the Minister will probably present a budget probably towards the end of February uh, across it. That will be the critical and there will obviously be discussions as to what the needs of departments will be going on over the next few weeks. This is something which has already been in the broadest level discussed at the, the Executive Away Day. Um, it can only ultimately come externally because realistically and particularly if you're looking to solve this in a um, and this will also unlock some of the work that will that will be able to be done in terms of the the work streams you know that is a sort of figure which um, you can't can't be generated up internally you know there are certain imaginative things can make small contributions but that sort of scale of money is something which can only come uh, by way of an external increase to the department's uh, budget I mean, to give an indication of things across the board in education, education, which is why sometimes we've been hit by national issues around pensions, around national insurance contributions. Uh, education in terms of its budget is more salary driven and more human driven than any other department in Northern Ireland. Around 80% of costs will come. Okay, we understand that, Mr. But the key, and you say externally. So, what well, exactly it, is being done to access that finance externally? Well, the finance externally will be the executive agreeing on a budget, uh, and agreeing on a budget for the Department of, of Education. With all those things in terms of how we deal with the challenges, uh, look, I can be as imaginative as possible in terms of hitting the big challenges. These can only be done if there's additional, considerable additional uplift in the, in the budget. I can't allocate money which simply isn't there okay. in that regard. Okay. Keen to bring other members in as well, Minister, and thank you for your answer so far. Uh, Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I thank the Minister uh, for coming? Um, Minister, I think we all agree um, uh, that uh, education is something which uh, really can't be overestimated. Um, and indeed that it isn't, as you refer to, just attendance at school, that the implications are that uh, education has a, a huge impact on the future of our young people, families, communities, and you made reference to the impact on the economy as well. And indeed the very broad outline uh, that you have given of your ministerial responsibilities I wonder, could I ask you, Chair, in terms of you made reference to reform, mm -hmm. and the need for reform, and indeed reform and legislation. You also indicated that uh, you weren't in the business of uh, seeking quick fix solutions. But could you perhaps outline to the committee which aspects of primary and secondary legislation you might be considering for the? I think that will arise out of. An I'll need to seek advice, and I know that, to take one example, if, if there are certain changes around substitution costs, if there may well be around flexibilities of issues as well, there will be advice of certain things that can be done that will require regulations or legislation, <coughs> and some that won't. Uh, sometimes there are things which are not very obvious issues out there in, in the public, but will actually have a major impact on our school system. So, for example, I think we do need, uh, and I know, to be fair, long before I was involved with this committee, that a report on inspection, and I think there's a need for changes in the way we do inspection. We need to move towards a situation in which there is much more of an improvement agency focus in terms of inspection. Um, I think inspectors have done a great job down the years, and they've actually quite often been the victims of industrial action um, on that. But... We need to move to a situation which there's a greater level of high trust for our, our teacher workforce and for schools. So that will, if you like, change an emphasis on the inspection. That's not something which is necessarily going to lead the headlines out there, but I think will have significant impact. Similarly, I think around workload and administration, I think we do need to burrow down to make sure that there isn't duplication around what, um, uh, what can be done. Sometimes that, that's actually more a question of, of miscommunication. You know, what schools may expect that they have to produce may not actually match with what's being, being asked for. So there's need a clarification, but we need to drill down on that. So it's, it's about a range of things of that nature, some of which will, are simply things which there are actions that can be taken. Some will have some sort of need for some legislative underpinning. Uh, clearly, for instance, in terms of providing 
better provision in terms of SEN. It requires SEN regulations to be put in place, but it then also requires, as part of the framework there, additional resources as well. So it's, it's kind of going hand in hand on those issues. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mull. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Minister and the Permanent Secretary for coming along. You're very welcome. I know we have only a short time today and there's so much to get through. Um, but I suppose what we're looking to cover is around the priority pressure, pressure areas. And I want to take you back to the teacher's <coughs> industrial action, <coughs> Minister. And um, you just touched there on inspection. Um, and I suppose ETA and the manner in which it operates is a concern to many of the unions. Um, uh, so I would like to ask you, what changes are you considering making as part of the resolution to the industrial action? And do they relate to those in the inquiry document carried out by the Education Committee in 2014? Well, the, there are implications, I think, in terms of, I think there's a lot of good work done by the Education Committee, and I can praise them because at that stage I wasn't a member of it, so certainly it's no um, self-recommendation in that regard. Uh, look, in terms of inspection, uh, clearly it's one of the areas in terms of work streams, but in the broader level, I think there's been a concern that First of all, inspection at one level was the easy area to have a go at during industrial action. And I think we do need to ensure that there is embedded inspection within the, the system. However, I, I believe that we need to move to a situation which, in terms of provision, is a little bit more light touch. Um, is one that, that focuses in um, on, as I said, which I think was one of the recommendations of the, the committee of, of moving towards a, a Northern Ireland sort of improvement service or whatever the, the exact titling. And I think that that's the level of, of refocusing. I think, to be perfectly honest on that, I think that those are sensible moves. And looking at that, for instance, uh, how we at least either ensure, either by clarification or by changes, that if we're looking for data to be produced for inspection, that we ensure that there's nothing over and above um, what is more or less generated generally by the, so there's no additional pressures. Sometimes, quite often, that has been maybe through misunderstandings, to be perfectly honest on it. Um, so it's around those, those sort of issues and looking at what way we can restructure uh, that, that side of things to a more cooperative relationship between the two. And to be perfectly honest, if there was an industrial action, I think that's something we need to do anyway, type of thing. Can I, can yes. I add a point, please, Chair? Yes, certainly. Um, just to clarify a point on the potential pay settlement, um, for, for, for the benefit of the committee, management side and the teachers' unions reached agreement in principle on a deal. Um, so even if we got the money today, um, that would still need to be put by the teaching unions to their members for their ratification. So it's not just a done deal. Yeah. And just to expand on the minister's point, um, I think you're probably aware that as part of that in principle agreement, we have identified a number of work streams yeah. and some of those focus explicitly on school governance arrangements, which includes inspection and workloads for both teachers and principals. I would just like to make this point. I think sometimes there's a bit of myth busting needs to be done around inspection because the majority, vast majority of inspections are very positive for schools in their outcomes. And through the discussions on the industrial action, there has been really good engagement between the teaching unions and the chief inspector. Um, and just for the benefit of the committee, if you don't already know, the chief inspector has announced her intention to retire later this year, so there will be a competition launched very, very soon for a new chief inspector of the Education and Training Inspectorate. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask a very brief supplementary further to that, uh, Derek? You mentioned the need to um, get teaching union um, support and sign off on, on any deal, obviously. I, I had asked previously, I'm not sure I got an, action or an answer. Uh, to what extent are you concerned uh, in terms of how quickly this in principle agreement needs to be financed and agreed before that good work, that goodwill? Uh, becomes very difficult to retain. Well, the treaty, in one sense, things have been stretched longer than ideally they would, they would have to be. But I also want to, if, if we're in a position to sign off on something, it's got to be on the basis of a firm foundation. Now, I think we are looking at, I'll be meeting, as indicated, I'll be meeting representatives of the five unions later on today. There has been, I think, good work has happened between the department and the unions. So I think there is still that, that goodwill there. I think that if we reach a point which there's a, an adequate budget settlement, 
that is a shorter time frame than probably will be there for, you know, it may take a month or two for the, the unions, and was one of the issues we wanted mm. to clarify with them, that if we reach a point at which there is that agreement and able to be implemented, uh, for them to get a, a formal sign-off from their members, um, that would require balloting. We need just to check out the time scale um, of that as, as well. Okay. Uh, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, Minister, welcome. And uh, again, congratulations on your reappointment to the post. Okay. And also, uh, although I've mentioned him in the Chamber, thanks to Derek Becker, who's been a fantastic uh, help uh, on many issues in the absence of the Assembly over uh, recent years. There, there's uh, huge challenges, Minister, and you've uh, uh, mentioned a few of them. Uh, and I know we could go into detail, and our time is uh, limited in relation to these matters. But one in particular that I'd like to flag up is concerns in relation to the Education Authority. Uh, in all schools that I have visited across my own constituency of West Sharon and those who I have engaged with beyond my constituency, there's a clear theme here that the Education Authority is not fit for purpose in the eyes of teachers, principals, parents, the public. Uh, and there's clear examples of why that's the case. And we've had uh, a principal recently came out and say that, that it's a complete meltdown, uh, that she couldn't get any support for staff or uh, for pupils uh, in relation to specific cases that she had uh, written to the Education Authority about, and also in relation to how they've mishandled in the absence of these institutions uh, special educational needs uh, forms that weren't date stamped, uh, and that was apparently uh, directed uh, within the Education Authority. So my question really is, what is the Minister's intention in relation to handling these matters in the Education Authority, given that it's only come into operation from the 1st of April 2015? There is no confidence in the body, as far as I can see, uh, from a teacher's point of view or the public's, uh, and uh, I think it needs major reform and certainly uh, uh, direct intervention from the Minister in terms of how it's been run. Well, I think in terms of a range of those issues, first of all, I suppose in terms of SEN, there has been, I think, a result of... of concerns that have been raised, an internal audit has taken place in terms of that. I think that is due to come to conclusion very, very swiftly. Uh, the key element, I suppose, for all of us, and while in one sense the handling of issues directly by EA, there is a certain amount of uh, internal sort of work that has to happen, the key element is to try to ensure that we get uh, proper provision and protection for the most vulnerable children without there. So I'll be looking at that with very closely. I think, to be fair to the EA, look, I think there have been problems that have, that have occurred. Um, probably to be fair in terms of the level of support, they, they will also be a certain amount of victim of the, the overall financial situation, which is that both uh, successive ministers and also the department has looked where there has not been enough money to be able to provide it. The first emphasis has been to try as, as much as possible to protect school budgets. Which means, I suppose, to be fair, the EA has taken a disproportionate amount of the, the hit within that. One of the byproducts of that has meant that you're in a little bit of a vicious circle that they're not able then to provide, I think, the level of support. Look, I, I'll be looking at what aspects are there. I think there is an element where there have been difficulties. There's an onus on the EA uh, at times, both financially and in terms of what it provides to ensure that it gets its own house in order. My officials have been working with the EA, particularly in terms of financially over the last few years, but we need to see uh, move beyond, I suppose, whatever has been by of teething problems and try to ensure. But there's no doubt, to be fair, I think they have been somewhat hamstrung as well by the, the lack of finances as well. Thank you, Minister, for the answer to the question. But there's major financial challenges in all the departments, and there absolutely are major financial challenges in your department, and that has had a knock-on effect. But it does not justify the absence of simple communication between the Education Authority and a principal of a school that is desperate for some support, advice or guidance on very delicate matters. And this is not an issue in isolation. Uh, there have been many examples, Minister. And I would suggest that the Department at a very serious level uh, and very, very quickly address the lack of communication between schools and the Education Authority, particularly when a teacher uh, who obviously would have tried or uh, exercised every possible avenue to deal with that situation, then resorted to calling the Education Authority for advice. No, I, look, that will be something Daniel will be raising directly with the um, be meeting the Chair and Chief Executive fairly soon in relation to that. I don't doubt yeah. that. I, I just add one point, Chair, please. I mean, you know, we sometimes hear these stories too. People say it about the Department as well, so we're not immune. Um, I would reinforce the point, I think the Education Authority had a very difficult birth 
It went on far too long, and five education and library boards were seriously debilitated before they came into one organisation. However, um, you may, and I know that the committee has asked for a paper on transformation. One of the work streams in that is about services provided to schools, pr primarily by the Education Authority, and there are a number of projects in there to improve the quality of services to schools, and I know the Authority is looking at that. What services do we provide? How efficient are they? More importantly, how effective are they? How responsive are they? We also have a project looking at the whole centre approach, <coughs> not through our eyes, not through a bureaucrat's eyes, but through the parents' eyes and through the child's eyes. So we are on the case with the Education Authority, and they're very, very <coughs> We've even given them some modest resources within the constraints that we operate from the transformation monies to look at the quality of services that they're providing to schools so we don't get those kind of complaints from schools that they feel abandoned. But I have a lot of sympathy with the Education Authority. They're dealing with very, very difficult issues and <coughs> massive resource constraints, and we are engaging with them. I accept the point you make. We get those complaints too. We have to address them together with the authority. Thank you. Okay, thanks. William Humphrey. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, congratulations, <coughs> Peter, on your uh, uh, position, uh, and uh, I look forward to working with you in, in your new role. And I know you'll bring a huge amount of energy and expertise uh, to the post. Uh, as has been said, I too would pay tribute to Derek and the, uh, the team in the absence of ministers and the job that he did uh, and thank him because at times I was in his ear complaining about some issues and, 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 and I must say he was on most occasions responsive <laughs> <laughs> and positive and being, being responsive. I, I would just, maybe maybe uh, the times he wasn't responsive, the ones maybe he shouldn't have got the right answer in. So. Uh, can, I, can I also just reinforce the point about the Education Authority? I mean, I was at a chair of governors last night at um, Girls Model, and I, I too share some concerns. Uh, and I know I've, you and I have spoken, and we were in a meeting with the EA in the summer in your role as the NS Party's education spokesman. Um, I appreciate the pressures that, that, that they may be under, Derek, but the principals are on the front line on, the, on this issue and are ac acutely under pressure in, in, in the schools on, on some issues. And frankly, there is no excuse for the EA just simply refusing to deal with or respond or communicate with principals. And then when public representatives get involved, as I've had to do a number of occasions, simply refuse to respond to public representatives okay. either. Yeah. It exacerbates the problem, it leads to greater frustration, and it cannot continue. Could I also just then ask uh, the Minister, um, could you give the committee some advice in terms of New Deal, New Approach? Um, there is a plan to establish um, uh, an expert group to deal with the linkages between um, the persistent problem of educational underachievement and the socio-economic background, particularly regarding young pros and boys. But equally, young pros and boys is, is an issue, but I think um, young Catholic boys a greater number, but in terms of percentage, uh, only a few percentages behind young pros and boys. Um, as someone who represents North Belfast, but this is a huge issue. Uh, can I ask what your, your plan would be there? Yeah, look, uh, there will be the group that will be established. To some extent, a lot of the research, because there's been different reports being produced into this, have has already been done. So I think a lot of the focus will be how we can actually implement and, and apply proper change. And a lot of that, while there will be, for instance, consistently on any, there's quite often some level of reference to, to transfer, for instance, the biggest issue across the board in terms of underachievement is investment in, in early years. And we've seen, for instance, the piloting of nurture units, which I think have been very helpful within that. There are issues around learning to learn, um, which again is part of the, the transformation uh, work streams. There is particularly, as, as it indicated now, there are, I suppose to be fair, there are a lot of successes of the education system. And if we take it one level, and it's true indeed in both communities, um, if we take it one level, the number of people who end up with no qualifications at all actually is around about less than 1% on that basis. But what we are getting is we're getting, if you like, pockets of, of um, high levels of underachievement. Um, and I think sort of trying to drill down into what actions can get taken. So I, th I think a lot of the stuff, um, I think, can be brought about of, of where we look at, at interventions. I think it's also critical in terms of underachievement. Um, th there is 
A, how we specifically target things at boys, because I think where there is particularly a gap, you're right, in terms of, and it's not unique to Northern Ireland, there's a wider problem in this, uh, on the gender side, that you get underachievement, particularly amongst, amongst males. So it's how we also can look at some specific measures um, in relation to that. I think one of the other lessons, and I've seen it, uh, arguably if you call it on both sides of the divide in different parts of North Belfast and West Belfast, uh, that it's critical of where there is collaborative efforts and particularly where there's community buy-in and how we actually harness that. I've seen that in the, uh, in the Shankill, I've seen it in some of the projects in West Belfast, I've seen it with the school principals in North Belfast, uh, that where you get that broader buy-in in education across the whole community, you can actually start to produce results. The other thing I think we shouldn't be afraid of is, because politicians, we're always accused of short-termism. You're looking for the, uh, as Robin put it, the quick fix. Sometimes it's, it's you know, what will, what will impact in a year or two years' time? Some of the investments and changes, and to be fair, some of the investments and changes have been made by previous education ministers, it may take 10 or 15 years to actually, you know, if, if you're making an intervention which improves education opportunities for two-year-olds, well, actually, where that will show up in GCSEs will be 14 years down the line. But simply the fact that there isn't an instant win should not in any way deter any, any of us from actually ensuring that that, and it is that sort of cradle to graduation sort of approach, I think, we'll, we'll need to be sort of... Can, can I add? Sorry, did you want to yeah. I was just going to add a point, um, you know, moving from the strategic to the very specific, the committee, or some of the committee may, may be aware of the major international benchmarking studies that go on PISA, published just before Christmas, and it found right across the world that we have the same link between economic disadvantage and educational underachievement. We're not unique. In fact, the problem here isn't as acute in other areas, and it might be interesting for the committee to get a briefing on that. But then specifically in terms of what we're doing, and again, Mr. Humphrey, you will be more aware than most of really imaginative stuff being done by principals in North Belfast, primary school principals, on a shoestring. And we managed to, you know, beg, steal, and borrow a bit of money from the Department of Justice. We're doing it in East Belfast too. Yeah. Some really good initiatives at a low level which will invest for the future. But th there's lots of stuff going on, you know, um, targeting social need, extended schools. We need to step back. We need to figure out what's working, what's not working, nurture units, uh, and come up and, with a coherent strategy. And as part, of, as part of it as well, both within Northern Ireland and maybe by well, best practice, there are good things that are happening. I suppose part of it is also how we roll out yeah. best practice, mm -hmm. how we share that information. Yeah. Yeah. I note, for instance, there's been, uh, with, uh, internally within the department, there's been a report on a number of schools in terms of um, underachievement and what actions we're getting taken. Yeah. One of the steps in taken when that has been, that has been completed is that is being shared very much on the website so that everybody can get access to some of the actions that are, that are taken. And it's about actually ensuring those best, best practice actions. And you know, none of us should be that, uh, in Northern Ireland, should be that proud that we, we don't see where a good initiative has happened elsewhere, that we can't replicate that. And quite often those things are on the basis of they're not particularly with a large financial cost. It's about the way of doing things. I think that, that is critical as well. Can I ask Before them? I bring you back in again, William, um, well, I realise the Minister is limited for time and I think we have four more questions to get in. So Actually, look, I, I, look, in, I'd be happy to stay until all questions are asked. Okay, that's very gracious. Thank you. So, William, bring you back in before we move on. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, can, can I just, in terms of the, the group, um, in terms of the export group, have you any idea at this stage, and I know it's early days and you're only in post, when the group will be established? Um, well, and and again, as with both groups, I've been looking at the next few months to do it. I want to take a wee bit of thought and a bit of cons uh, consultation with a few people so that we make sure that... We, with both these groups, we basically get one bite at this. So I want to make sure it's, it's got right. And there are people who've got particular levels of expertise who may not be direct, may or may not be directly involved with uh, the groups, but may be able to give that degree of advice. So I want to... I think, I think the key to, to that... Um, Minister, is that the getting people who are closer to the situation, you know, yeah. not exclusively so, but that, that they have a key part in, in that group of experts. Because, for example, the committee unanimously agreed last week one of the major challenges of facing young people, not, not solely young people, but young people in our community, is the issue of mental health, suicide awareness and, and general well-being. And I think one of the things we, the committee agreed on a joint meeting between this committee and health I think one of the things that, and I've mentioned this to Mr. Baker before, uh, one of the things is absolutely totally essential in this is that there's a joint up that's across government between Department of Education, Department of Health, Public Health Authority, Department of Communities, um, 
Belf the in my case Belfast City Council, but local government in, in general, um, in terms of taking taking this forward, so that there's a multi-agency approach to tackle the issue that is a pandemic across uh, the community, particularly acute in in, in um, uh, North and, and West Belfast, as you will be aware. And we need to address those. And I think those are some of the issues that. No, I th look, I think I think that's undoubtedly the case. I think in terms of cross depart departmental working, particularly as regards mental health, will be will be critical. I think it's important both in terms of the commissions, but even in terms of a range of the work, that we have voices at the centre of that who are directly on the front line. So, for example, we've mentioned in terms of issues around workload and administration, and. You know, look, there's important input in terms of the interaction between, say, education agencies. So you have the EA, you have the department, you have some of the sectoral bodies. That, that is all fine. But if you're looking to take the example, say, on the administration side of it, I would like people sitting around the table there who actually are directly day in, day out, or perhaps school principals or school teachers, who can actually say, well, actually, it, some of this will be strategic, some of this will be nitty gritty. So, for instance, if you talk administration, well, actually, Formex is being looked for, really, we're already supplying that information via Form Y. That's not really needed. That can be cut out. But it's that level of knowledge of the impact it has on the data. And that, that applies in all those, those aspects. So I think it will be critical that there's at least thinking and voices around the table who are directly there on the front line. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure the committee would be glad to feed proposals in <laughs> for your consideration in terms of the <coughs> compositions of those reviews as well, Minister. Yeah, and yeah. look, I'd be happy yeah. to receive any, okay. any information. Can I bring that. Robbie Butler, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Minister. Herman is Secretary. Um, yeah. I'll try and truncate this, but I've got, I'll, I'll have two questions, but I just wanted to thank you for your early attendance here and your openness. Mm -hmm. um, I wish you well, Minister. Uh, I think this is, <coughs> is, is certainly uh, been no groundbreaking statement to, to say that education is perhaps the most important, along with health. Uh, ministry, and I want to thank the Permanent Secretary for the work that you've done over the past few years, the accessibility that we have had with you wh while you have held the fort in our absence. And I think um, there will be a measurable price to pay actually for that absence. Glad you're back. Well, <laughs> well I, I, do, I, I do thank you for that, and there are great challenges. And, and I'm new to the committee, and when I've looked through my packs and I've seen the complexity of our education system, I shudder. Mm. And it concerns me, and it worries me that to fix this, the multiple layers and the, the different groups and, 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 and things that have been added to the education portfolio over years is, makes it so cumbersome. And, and when you look at the, the budget and the proportion of the budget that it takes, it's, uh, it's easy to see how we could lose money and not maybe best spend it. But I do wish you well, and I believe this committee is certainly set out in the, on the right foot. And I know the Chair will do a good job. And one final commendation to yourself, Minister, is the, when you talked about mental health. So it's well reported that our young people um, suffer poor mental health more than they, they ever did. However, uh, th there's a duty on us to look after our teachers too, and you picked that up in your statement, and I really welcome that and would commend that piece of work uh, as taken seriously because we, if we want to factor kids, uh, our teachers need to be uh, reinforced in, in their duty. So the two questions, the first one's an easy one, I think, um, and probably will be a straightforward answer, and the second one, if you'll indulge me. First one is around the announcement uh, about post-primary places that have been announced, the extra ones in around the Greater Belfast area. So the, the simple question in and around that, is it going to be in place for September 2020? Well, and will there I, I should point now, I mean, where there are things that are uncontroversial, I want to see those fast track. I should put a slight caveat that I think that has been announced as proposals from the Education Authority. Yeah. Will require development proposals, but what I think we want to do across the board <coughs> as regards to development proposals, there will be a range of... Development proposals covers a multitude of sins. I should also say, because I mean, it's maybe been remiss of me so far to... Thank particularly, I know in the um, in the interim period as well, the, the immense amount of hard work has been done by departmental officials, by Derek in particular. Um, so that to some extent, while there's been restrictions on what they can do, uh, things have not stood still for three years. We've not been in, in a form of stasis in that regard. Um, I think there's an opportunity because with development proposals to effectively get a uh, a two tier type type system. Um, specifically where there are some issues around placement, about number of places, and sometimes that's also an issue of right sizing, that things can be grouped together as proposals, they can be moved fairly quickly. And to some extent, if you're making some adjustments to some of the numbers, that should be something which is fairly uncontroversial. Clearly, if there's a proposal to close school X, merge school Y and Z, 
those things will take a little bit more time, even if we're trying to ensure that things move as quickly as possible. There's much more sensitivities around that. There is at least a degree of fallback situation of um, this is supposed to permanently vary mm. the numbers that are there. But there is also provision so that, for example, if on a particular proposal that is not through by a particular time, it can't be brought through, there is the power and has been used, and particularly has been used in the last year or two, of temporary variations. So if it is a question of, look, the change is not ready to be there as a permanent position for September, there is the opportunity then to effectively do the same thing by temporary variation. What I think we are getting, particularly in Belfast, on both different sort of sectors out there, is a pressure in terms of demographics on those on those places, particularly in Belfast, and that will require. Uh, you know, there's no point saying, "Well, we're going to get 50 extra places for this this school, and we're going to do it 10 each year for the next five years, or whatever." You know, it, it, if that is clearly a long-term issue, then it requires a development proposal. But I think we can actually progress a lot of those things on a sort of a two-speed side of things on it. But particularly as regards of flips in terms of numbers, there is a route which, even if there's any degree of slowness on one side of it, can then be progressed. Well, just, just on that, then, just to finish this one out, I think there, there's a need then for for, for the uh, parents out there and, and people that will be seeking a place in those schools where the variation <coughs> has been alluded to, uh, as this is only a proposal now. The, the difficulty is managing expectations, obviously, and I totally accept that, that it can either be done through a substantive change or the temporary variation policy. Just thinking, would it be possible I then for you to work with the EA on this, make it a priority? Yeah. That absolute information. We, we, we can't. We, look, we can move. We can move fairly quickly on that. I suppose the only yeah. thing we're just slightly restricted on, uh, even though there will be a range of things that will be uncontroversial, from a development proposal I'm still, and the department is the legal authority doing that, so obviously I can't, there's a limit yeah. I might say, but yeah, I mean look, there's already been work that's gone on, uh, particularly on one aspect of things, which is right sizing, um, in terms of, there will be a number of schools that sometimes for historic reasons have a particular enrolment figure which doesn't actually match the reality. Yes. It's maybe something that was decided in the 1980s because of a particular set of circumstances. Um, those can actually be grouped together and effectively taken as one decision across a range of schools. So th there are ways that, that those things can move uh, in a quicker fashion. I, I, I just want to add, the, the proposals that you're talking about, as the Minister says, are for a permanent fix. Um, two years ago, hands up, we were caught out by some pressures in transfer to post-primary schools. We didn't have enough numbers in certain locations, in Bangor in particular, and we had to scramble using a very clunky mechanism called temporary variations, and it wasn't great. Last year, we planned for it, and we did a lot better, um, because we put additional places uh, in schools in advance, and we're planning for transfer uh, 2020 this September again. Detailed plans are in place. We hope we're doing it even better. So, and I think it's your point that individual schools and parents will know what the admissions numbers are well in advance when they apply. That work is well underway, and I'm sure we could brief. I think on there's, there's also a small point, um, but important point, particularly for parents, which is that sometimes there's a misconception that when they're making a choice particularly in terms of um, a transfer situation, that if they put down a range of schools, that some way putting school X down at number five would prejudice their chances of getting their first choice. That is not the case. And not, if, not for all schools. What's oh, right? Not for all schools. There are some schools that require a particular approach mm -hmm. to ordering. Oh, well, no, I'm not but saying like that, but what, what, yeah. what I'm saying is the fact that if you have your particular school and you want to put that down number one, the fact that you're putting something further down the list shouldn't make a particular impact. And what sometimes is the case, every year there's, there's always a certain number of unplaced children. Sometimes that has been because there is a, a disconnect between the number of applications across the bit and, in an area and the number of available places, and that's where particularly I have to step in. And some of that is driven at times by parents making simply a one school choice or a two school choice um, on that, and I would encourage parents to make at least a range of choices that, you know, obviously they will want to get into particular schools on that basis, but it's important to be able to give that certainty to children that, that, that there is that sort of level of choice. Obviously I can't interfere in parents' choices, but I would certainly encourage them to do so. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. that, that certainly, that certainly <coughs> something. So that's, that's the here and now, but this is more a strategic question, so probably more in keeping with the, the, the conversation Oops. today. Try, try and keep it brief, okay. Robert. Yep, no here problem. we go.
Okay, this is to do with uh, transfer testing, so I found myself writing a letter to myself on Saturday at my 10-year-old self because of the pressures that our young people find themselves under with the transfer testing. And I know previously you had made a commitment to look at how we do that, and I'm hoping that you do that. just wanted to ask you, would it be a priority for you to address uh, transfer testing and streaming, and perhaps even consider a further look at the Dixon plan and how we address kids? And the, the reason for it, I'll just finish this one out, is if I want to do a GCSE today, I can do it. If I want to do an A-level today, I can do it. We get one shot at that test. It seems grossly unfair at 10 years of age that we're burdening our young people um, and, and streaming. I, I think, Robbie, look, there will be... I'd, I'd make two points. If there is, within the current system, anything that can be done which will ease the pressures on children in terms of, um, from a process point of view, and ideally I would like to see a situation, that, for instance, even in terms of two organisations, and there has been sporadic work between the two at times, to reach a sort of a common position, I think that at least would be helpful because most children do, will do either AQA or they'll do GL, but there's an overlap. I think at least at least a thousand probably would do the overlap if we can reduce that in. <coughs> Anything I can do to ease the situation, I think, will be um, I will try and do. Although some of that is outside my gift, I can act as a persuader, facilitator, etc. I'm conscious across the board, and I know that. Um, there is a strong support for Dixon. I want to ensure that Dixon is therefore protected where it happens on that basis. What I'm also conscious of a little bit, if we talk too much, particularly on the transfer bit, if, if we talk about whether there should be um, academic selection or non-academic, I would take a particular view. This is a, a, an argument which has been raging for 50 plus years. Yeah. And I'm a little bit conscious that there will be a range of things where I don't simply disappear down a rabbit hole, which... Um, you know, we could sit in this committee, I suspect, and debate academic selection um, you know, for many, many years, and we're not, I don't think we're going to reach a consensus on it. So it's doing what can be, what can be done in, in relation to that. If there's any action that I can take that can ease that, that situation, then I would try and take that. Well, we, our predecessor committee um, agreed an inquiry into educational attainment and post-primary transfer. That is... Uh, available to us to reinstate, so we'll be given that consideration. In and and that's, that's no problem. I mean, look, I, I think look, no problem. The, the, real, the reality is going to be is that you, it is no difficult problem. to see at a political level or even a societal level where there's, there's a consensus. That they're very different. And one concern sometimes I have with um, the, and I know I've raised this with yourself whenever we've been on sometimes um, program, every time there is a debate around uh, underachievement, the easy thing for some, particularly in broadcast media, to do is to bring on two people who have a different view on selection and spend the hour discussing that when actually the real focus needs to be on, on the quality interventions you can do at an at early age on that regard. Okay, uh, Catherine Kelly, MLA. Thanks. Um, thank you both for coming this morning um, and speaking with us. Just on that, um, when you talk about underachievement and early intervention, um, I think that the child care strategy um, and it being published um, is something that needs to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and my question on that would be when um, will it be published? Um, as well as that, um, sure start. Um, we've seen the budget for the last two years has remained the same. Um, and I think we would probably all be in agreement that we need to see further investment going into sure start. Um, and is the department working on a development plan to increase um, the resource? Well, in terms of, in terms of Sure Start, look, we'll work to put as much money as we can into that. I, look, it's, it's difficult to make any particular budgetary commitments on things. I appreciate the thing until we can actually see what the global bit is. And if you take the worst case scenario, um, if we've got a standstill budget and say, for the sake of argument, I'm left with a £400 million gap, it's very difficult then to increase facilities and, and certain things on it. Yeah, it's undoubtedly the case that early intervention is, is, is critical and we need to actually ensure, and that's where the Permanent Secretary said about taking a little bit of a step back to make sure that we're allocating resources as well as we, we possibly can. Um, I think there are also kind of inventive ways where we can particularly, for instance, encourage issues around reading, um, I think, would be critical. Again, I think there's imaginative uh, solutions around that. But I'm aware of Sure Start, I'm aware of, of some of the pathways funding that is there when you get it to schools, the nurture side of it. So there are good interventions which we want to ensure get support. And I'm also keen, at, at the very least, to try and protect that funding um, if, if there is a sort of a tighter financial position. So 
issues around sure start pathways and not be looking to be cutbacks there if, if, if enforced in a, in a financial situation. And that, to be fair, has been the approach that has been taken by the department in the last few years when there has been some gaps and we've not been able to do as much as we want to or even had to sometimes seek cuts. The one thing effectively we've ring-fenced has been those early interventions. And that's absolutely, I think that's absolutely critical. Yeah. And I think just to add to that point, you know, when money has been tight, and we have ended up, or I have ended up as an accounting officer in an overspend position, which is a really uncomfortable place to be and a wrong place to be. We have actually protected all of those programs, Nurture, Sure Start, Pathways, even though they are non-statutory. Youth is statutory and schools are statutory, those two are, because we recognise the longer term benefits, but it is dependent. And Minister, just on the childcare strategy, is there a time scale? Oh yeah, no time. To, well, look, we're hoping fairly soon to put a, a paper to the the executive. As I said, I think the problem will be that that will take. Even if we get a green light on a particular proposal, uh, it will take a reasonable length of time um, to shift up from from where we are to where we need to be. Um, and in particular, a lot of that's around capacity. So, for example. At the moment, we have what can be counted as, as full-time nursery provision, which doesn't cover the full 30 hours anyway, is around about three in every eight um, children, and the remainder will be, the majority will be on part-time. But if, for example, one solution was to, to move towards um, everybody getting that form of, you know, you're talking about uh, probably millions of additional hours, which actually physically, in terms of premises, in terms of workforce, you know, there will be a certain level of, of upskilling and expansion that will be required. So not there's an issue around expectation that, but it's undoubtedly the case that both in terms of educational development of, of young children, uh, if we can provide that a childcare expansion, but also in terms of, you know, it, it is a massive spin-off in terms of the economy, in terms of how actually sort of the pressures that are there in families, if they can actually create a situation where there's, there's that greater level of provision. Uh, you know, so in that sense, it's a no-brainer. The only issue will be getting the finance for it to be able to, to do it and do it as quickly as we can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, we'll finish then with Morris Bradley and Justin McNulty. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Congratulations on your appointment, Minister, and thank you very much for coming here today. And also thanks to the Permanent Secretary. I know that in our absence, he's been a very busy boy. boy. So we to take a bit of pressure off now that we're, we're back here. So. My question, Minister, you've alluded a lot to, to the budget uh, pressures you have, but can you advise us roughly how much money will be needed to meet this new de decade, new approach undertaking well, to ensure <coughs> that every school has a sustainable budget? Well, OK, specifically on that, I think we've estimated that really to close, you know, there's a little bit where you can have a certain movable feast in relation to that, but we would estimate perhaps around about £60 million that would be required to be mainstreamed. That doesn't bring us back up to the position that we were in a few years ago. And it's a question of how fast we can move to start closing that gap. That's a recurrent figure. I guess one of the issues a little bit, because there's obviously reference in the, the New Deal to a range of things, there's a little bit of a, a movable feast as to whether you put that as a effectively an inevitable pressure that's going to be there next year or part of the New Deal bit. Because you can look at school budgets uh, but there's also, I think, reference in New Deal. Childcare, for example, has been is one of the areas that, that is referenced. In terms of the bigger ticket items, ensuring that there's a SEN uh, mm -hmm. side of things. And also, actually, as well, resolution to industrial action has also moved with the New Deal. So yep. we can put different things in different columns. There are some of the smaller specific items that have been mentioned about the commissions, about uh, greater work, for instance, with schools in Ulster Scots, for instance. A lot of those things, while they're very the last thing, while they're very important, are not big financial asks, and that <coughs> should be accommodated. Um, but you know, we're looking at, as I said, we've made an estimate, maybe a 60 million next year is what we would need to see. That that will not bring schools back up to the position where they are in a comfortable position. But what it hopefully would mean that they would be in a position, then at least that their expenditure can meet the resources. But it wouldn't enable them effectively, if you want a better word, to do anything particularly new or additional. And that basis. I think the other issue which relates to that, which is again part of the work streams, is also while well, the big problem is the lack of finance, uh, through for instance looking at common funding formula, we want to make sure that um, 
that we are spending the money as well as we can on that basis, which is always a difficult thing because that will mean ultimately some money coming away from the school, some money going, uh, and also looking whether we're using the right use of your Martin funding, for instance, on that, on that basis. But the big item is clearly the big gap that is there in terms of um, what is needed to essentially pay up there. And, and, and praising the um, uh, and praising the permanent secretary obviously didn't do what I suggested was to close various schools in East London area just before I came into <laughs> office so that he would take the blame rather than, rather than me, Morris. Well, we'll leave that there, but can I ask a more <laughs> quick... Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's just in relation to the new new, gear, new decade, new approach. Uh, does going into the future mean to save money we're going to have fewer skills, skills but larger skills? Well, look, area planning and the logic of that being for a number of years has been that there will be ultimately some level of reduction in terms of schools. There is, you know, there's no doubt from an efficiency point of view and, a, and an economic point of view, there are some implications of that. The bigger issue, I think, from my perspective, is the educational impact yeah. at times. Now, there is some really good, um, really good work has gone on in lots of very small schools, and we're also it's also keen um, that that from a point of view of parents' choice, from the point of view of communities, that we don't leave um, children entirely isolated, that they're a long, long distance away from a school <coughs> on that basis. Um, but, you know, again, it's part of the thing that if you started from a blank page, you wouldn't have the distribution of schools that you would have. But we realise that there's, there's a lot of sensitivities around where schools are uh, on that basis. So, But it, it's, it will have some economic impact, but it's not... I, I wouldn't overestimate the impact that would have on the pure savings point of view. It's, it's probably more in terms of sensible arrangements of, of sustainable provision for, um, for that. And part of the problem as well is that for schools who have perhaps been put in that place by Education Authority or previously Education Boards, I think one of the reasons why I want to see things moving, moving quicker is that once a school is put under that question mark, there's a shadow hanging over that which creates problems for the school, yeah. creates problems for the parents. And I think it's therefore important that at least while things are done thoroughly and done correctly, that they're not prolonged for the sake of being prolonged. Okay. Thank Justin McGill. Yeah, thank thanks, you, Justin. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, and congratulations on your reappointments. Um, and it's already very apparent you're, you're thoroughly over your brief. Um, and can you also thank the Permanent Secretary, Derek Baker, who has been very, very helpful and very um, responsible the last number of years in all of our I actions. assume he hasn't bribed all of you to say this type <laughs> of thing. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Not that we would be rivalable anyway. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefits of establishing privileges. <laughs> can I ask the, the Minister, can you confirm that the uh, £68 million from the Finance Minister to resolve the ongoing disputes with the Teachers' Trade Unions and are you in a position to say, to confirm whether that money will be forthcoming? It will depend, Justin, entirely, I think, uh, in terms of that money. It's not there present. I think it will be an issue of, for next year's budget, uh, which, again, as I said, will be announced within the... Uh, you know, I think, to be fair, there is a strong desire, I suspect, amongst finance ministers and others, to see this resolved. He's probably put in this slightly invidious position of the pressures that are there from all departments are much greater than what is available. So there's going to have to be levels of discussion. That's a key priority, I think, and, and that has an impact on our, our children, obviously, as, as well as well as the, the staff in terms of that. So there hasn't been a sign-off on it because the money isn't there, but there's an opportunity for it to be brought into play um, from the budget, which will be announced probably roughly in a month's time. Okay, and should the, the Department of Finance make the £68 million available, can you confirm that the money will be used to finance the deal as agreed with, by your department and the employing authority with the trade unions in May 2019? Yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, measures to be, to be progressed urgently and reviewed in the nine key areas, how long do you anticipate action on outcomes on the measures to be corrected? Well, to be progressed urgently and the reviews in the 19 years. Are you talking in terms of the, the transformation stream or the, the, work, the work groups? I think it's the work streams with, associated with a potential pay award. Yeah. So there's, yeah. there's a certain amount that has, but a preparatory work has been done. I suppose in terms of actioning them until there is a final resolution, I suppose there's a limited amount, and some will require, some are things which simply can be done on an administrative level and can be produced. Um, I mean, the work streams, I was just, let me just read into the record in terms of that maybe. 
useful enough. So, uh, review of the employment model for teacher, review of the use of temporary and substitute teachers, review of workload uh, agreement, uh, review of workload impact on school leavers, review of workload associated with special educational needs, review of accountability framework, which obviously takes in uh, inspection, uh, review of consultation arrangements, and that's between management and, and teacher unions, review of statutory assessments at key stage one, two and three, review of initiatives to promote and support teacher health and wellbeing. Now, I think with those, you know, I also want to see that there's no delay in those and we get as many of those over the line. Because there's maybe very different aspects to those, some will, will come quicker than others. It's not, you know, I will not be waiting for a situation if we get agreement that here are nine work streams, they've got to wait for all nine work streams. We can't wait to the slowest boat, to be perfectly honest on it. And if we get, for instance, a, a agreement or even sort of a, even sort of here are some interim improvements that we can make and we're not I'd be keen to get those announced over the line and implemented as, as, as soon as possible uh, on that regard. Because even if you take something on workload, if, if there's certain things could be agreed early and said, well, actually, here's A, B and C that can be done. I know, but there's further discussion to be had on that. Let's at least get those banked and moved on. To be perfectly honest on it, Justin. I, th I think just add, there's a capacity issue on the teacher union side as well that we have to acknowledge. You know, we, we have kind of made some limited provision for some of those work streams within our transformation program, and we're ready to put resource into that immediately. I think we've got to help the teaching unions too, because there's a big burden on them. All of these work streams will be done in conjunction and partnership with the teacher unions. It won't be unilateral. Okay, thank you. In terms of uh, does the minister ex expect that any of the schools with a very big, let's say, one million plus deficit are going to have to close in the short to medium term because of their financial position? Well, look, sustainability is the financial sustainability is one aspect of things, but sustainability is, is a wider side of things. And it's probably <coughs> Again, given that, that across the board there will be a range of development models put forward, which I'll have to take a final legal decision. It's probably inappropriate to comment on uh, on that sort of wider, but without potentially sort of risking uh, there being implications being drawn up. But I would say, yes, looking at where there is an important bit as to how financially sustainable schools are, there are issues around uh, what sustainability of school numbers are in relation to that. So there is, but I, I should also say as well, We've had for a number of years a sustainable schools policy. I think internally we're looking also to see. I mean, I think people broadly think that, that may well be the general direction of travel. I think we're going to, we're taking a look at that internally to see whether or not the sustainable schools policy itself is sustainable. If you know what I mean, if we, if we need to see if there's any level of tweaks that we need to, to do to that to make sure that what is there is still absolutely fit for purpose. Okay, thank you, Minister. Yeah, last question, Chair. Uh, just right, f further to what William and Robbie have discussed earlier, um, is there potential to introduce a resilience element to the education curriculum and in relation to teachers to address the epidemic that's No, look, I, I think that, so that's one of the areas we want to be looking at, and particularly in conjunction with, uh, uh, with health on that basis of what, what provision we make. As I said, there is the two sides. The, the, the main focus, and understandably and rightly so, is on the impact on pupils. There's also then resilience of staff as well would need to be done. Again, sometimes there can be a range of interventions which can be very useful. I think looking at where we can build resilience into the curriculum, I think, is, is one of them. Um, but there are also ideas, there, there are things that are out there. I know, for instance, um, having been at a meeting uh, a while ago with, I know, um, someone who happens to be sort of more or less a, a constituent of mine who, who'd actually just, who at that stage was actually at school has made suggestions, I know, in her school that there is a sort of a, and I know Robbie will have met the, the individual concerns as well, that has particularly sort of peer support side of things, which is not something which requires financing, but is a good idea as work. And, you know, we look at ideas like that as well to see, but it's, it's probably, you know, there isn't a single silver bullet which solves everything that nature. It will be a cocktail, but to looking at resilience that we can build in, I think. Well, it's something that all of us as legislators must agree yeah. to tackle, and it's cross departmental, and it's because of that, but we need to take responsibility. It is, and I mean, look, the executive yeah. as a whole, even leaving aside the particular circumstances of schools and young people, the executive as a whole, I think, agree this is a critical issue. And I know when we were at the away day, that was one of the key topics that we were 
discussing. Can I just add on it? There's work, you know, even before the executive came back and committed to mental health issues and resilience, there was work well advanced in the department with the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency on looking at a health and well-being framework for young people working together. Should resource come available, or even if it shouldn't, what can we do and what can we do better? And maybe it's again at some stage we'd be happy to brief the committee on that work with our colleagues in health. We we'll have a we we'll have a briefing scheduled yeah. on that. Okay, okay. Sure. Yeah. Ahead of me. But Minister, uh, thank you. Just to close, thank just you, for Minister. for the avoidance of doubt, uh, further to our meeting with the the teacher teaching unions, and, and given that the the new decade new approach document is so clear that the commitment from the executive is to urgently resolve the teachers' industrial dispute, can I can I check with you your assessment of any consequence of not urgently resolving that teacher dispute, given that we are talking about next budgets as the stage that that will be resolved? Well, yeah, but don't forget when we're talking about next budgets, we're talking about something that's going to be announced probably within the next month Okay. on that basis. But no, look, uh, there's undoubtedly, and, and part of the reason why, look, look, there's always a danger that, that any minister can highlight the money as opposed to the policy issues. I suppose the reason why I highlight the money is on the really the big ticket items uh, some of which need solved, such as industrial action, such as school Requires finances. finance, yeah. There's yeah, no way know, around that. Look, yeah. uh, it is undoubtedly the case that, that yeah. if the money is made available, there is resolution that, that can happen. If it's not, then we are collectively in very difficult yeah. situations. You know, okay. I'm not, I'm not minimising that, okay. uh, that, that risk. Okay. Well, look, uh, we agree. Decisive investment, decisive action is needed. We will work with you and hold you account on those issues, but we're extremely grateful for the, uh, the and time. And if any, if any influence of the today. finance minister, um, yep. it would be greatly appreciated as but well. Sincere <laughs> thanks. And, and to echo what the other members have said in terms of the work conducted by the department, in particular the permanent secretary, we're extremely grateful for that. Thank <coughs> you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, our next agenda item then is agenda item six. Uh, it's our Department of Education officials briefing. There is a briefing paper from the clerk at page 15, tab two, and a departmental briefing paper at page 39, tab three, and further questioning at page 100, tab five. Um, I'd also refer members to tabled items, which include papers from the Department of Education and correspondence from teaching unions. Uh, this session will be also recorded by Hansard and I'm very glad to be able to welcome from the Department of Education, Leanne Patterson, Deputy Secretary, John Smith, Deputy Secretary, Harry Fair, Director of Finance and Philip Irwin, <coughs> Director of Investment and Infrastructure. Officials, can I invite you to make uh, perhaps three short presentations of no more than 10 minutes each? Uh, we'll suggest we start with Leanne, uh, followed by Gary, and then followed by Philip and John, after uh, which uh, we will take questions on, on each presentation. Um, if officials are content to uh, see in that format, thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to attend the committee today and to provide an overview of some of our key departmental business. Um, as um, the Chair has said, my name is Leanne Patterson and in my role as Deputy Secretary, I've got responsibility for a range of central <coughs> corporate functions, which include finance, the capital programme, area planning, primary and post-primary admissions and teachers' pay and pensions. And my director colleagues with me today are Gary Fair on my right and Philip Irwin um, on my left. And shortly they'll be presenting on finance and capital respectively. I'd like also to introduce um, Janice Gallen, who is the director who leads on area planning, and Mark Bailey is the director in my area who oversees the teachers' pay and pensions, and they will be very happy to brief committee in future sessions on the programme. So today, just in my introductory comments, I wanted to say a few words on two main areas. Um, the first is on transformation, and the second is on the area planning project work that we've been doing. Um, and at the end, I'm very happy to take any questions on, on anything. So starting firstly with the Education Transformation Programme, and I'm aware the Minister has described his preferences on this area in, at the start of the early session, so I, I won't rehearse too much of that. Um, and you've also seen the paper that was received in advance. But by way of background context, the programme originated during the absence of ministers um, to consider a range of issues so that proposals would be there for ministers' consideration on return. So it wasn't about um, 
our official setting and agenda. Rather, we wanted to take the opportunity to focus on a number of issues that, according to the feedback from stakeholders and our own analysis, needed to be attended to. There's quite limited funding for the programme. Just one million was spent last year, and three million is available this year. So it's not the major transformation that is referred to in the New Decade, New Approach document. Rather, we're seeking to do continuous improvement and to work at the areas that we know that need to be improved within this finance envelope. The Minister, as he said earlier, will now consider whether and how the projects align to his emerging priorities and above all with any post-New Decade New Approach Transformation Programme. But a positive feature of the programme in the work that we've been doing has been the number of individual projects that we've been able to work in partnership with stakeholders across the sectors on. And I know Gary will pick this up later on this morning whenever he describes the work done on the review of the Common Funding Scheme project. So just in, in, in closing around the um, transformation programme, I wanted to let the committee know as well that there is shortly going to be, starting next week, a gateway review, which is really a way of a health check on the programme. And coming out of that gateway review, there will be a report issued to Derek Baker as permanent secretary and SRO for the project. And um, he would be more than happy to share the outcome of that review with the committee in due course. So just in closing then, the transformation programme by no means represents the totality of the policy work going on in the department. And as you're aware, and we'll have covered in the earlier session, there is much going on in areas such as tackling underachievement and SEN and um, other areas that will be picked up in future weeks in briefings from colleagues. So I'd like to just move on briefly, if I may, to the area planning area, which is under my remit. Um, and as you know, area planning is the process of strategic planning of primary and post-primary education provision and contributes to the draft programme for government outcome 12. We give our children and young people the best start in life. So robust area planning needs to be undertaken on a whole system basis. And there are well-established planning engagement structures to facilitate gathering views from as wide a range of stakeholders as possible. However, despite these structures being in place, the department fully recognises that area planning is a complex matter and needs to be handled with sensitivity working with communities through the process. We recognise as well the need for an injection of pace into the area planning process. We still have too many small schools and significant numbers of schools which fall underneath the sustainability thresholds. So progress and our processes are too slow. And to that vein, we've been working with our planning authorities under the DE Transformation Programme on a project entitled Delivering Schools for the Future. This is to improve and seek to improve the overall efficiency of the project on the process. And I'd just like to highlight that the three strands within that project are strand one, which is looking to increase the pace through a more collaborative approach and better planning. Strand two is seeking to identify barriers to effective planning and the publication of development proposals and to shorten that long period that exists at the moment. And strand three is seeking to update the sustainable schools policy to reflect the current context. So we've accumulated a significant volume of evidence that identifies barriers to effective and efficient area planning. And we're currently working to bring forward proposals to strengthen policy, practice and guidance to improve the process. And we look forward to sharing and engaging with the committee on those as we go forward. Further detail on the project's been provided in the PAC on Transformation paper, and I'd just like to close by saying we have a wide bank of information and very, very interesting infographics on the whole area of area planning, and particularly on these projects that we're doing to increase the pace, and we'd be very happy to provide a fuller briefing to the committee in future sessions if the committee so wishes. <coughs> so thank you for your time at this point. I, would l I will pause because I'm going to be passing to Gary and then Philip to cover other areas of my remit, but I'm very happy to take any questions that members have at this stage. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, no, it would be good just to, to take a moment for some uh, short questions. Um, area planning is obviously absolutely essential uh, to transformation process. Um, I think there is significant concern that uh, it has to date failed to deliver the reform necessary for a more sustainable and integrated education system. Um, you mentioned that work had been done to identify barriers to um, efficient area planning. Could you advise the committee what some of those barriers have been? 
Well, yes, certainly. And I think in terms of bringing forward papers, we'd be more than happy to share the papers on the barriers work that's been done in conjunction with our stakeholders. But I think some of the key barriers that we've identified are the fact of the actual process end to end is, is long. Um, it requires obviously consultation with the key stakeholders and bringing people along with the process. However, it's not necessarily the case that we can bring things to a close and therefore they have a tendency to just develop and unravel and then it's difficult to bring the separate stages of the process together and to close them and then move on to the next process. So one of the things we'll be looking for to bring out of the barriers piece is to say how can the sectors work better together and I think that's one of the key things that we've identified. We do need the sectors to be able to come to this and work collectively as looking at this as a system-wide solution as opposed to individual sectors. So in, in looking at the barriers piece, and as I say, we're more than happy to provide the committee with a further detailed paper on that, but it has been about how can we streamline all the different pieces of the jigsaw that work along that period to try to shorten the overall process. Okay, and, and are there good examples of um, work to overcome that bars. I'm, I know I'm aware myself of the Ulster University Community Conversation Toolkit. Are, are, are we seeing some examples of how we're beginning to overcome those barriers? Yes, we are certainly seeing some examples and I think even in some of the shared education campuses, which I think Philip will be touching on later, we'll be, we've seen really good examples. One of the key things is where communities actually have a will and a desire to work together, it absolutely hugely impacts on the efficiency of the area planning process. Okay, would certainly like to take a more detailed briefing at, at a later yes. date. Uh, can I bring members in at this stage then? William Humphrey. Uh, thanks Chair. Thank you very much for <coughs> your, your presentation so far. Can I ask the Department okay, to give us some advice to the meat on the bones in relation to the education transformation programme um, in terms of the work strand delivering schools for the future? Yes, that is the project that is within the area planning mm -hmm. and there are the three strands that yes. um, I have <coughs> articulated there. So just in terms of the first strand, that is seeking to increase the pace and that's looking at how do we do actually our annual planning process and there will be a policy paper coming to the Minister shortly to look at our planning cycle. At the moment we're on a planning cycle of three years and there's a view that would we be more efficient across working with a slightly longer term time frames and would we be better looking at five years. So in terms of being able to identify clear deliverables within that period, because three years sometimes doesn't allow us to do that. Um, the second strand of the delivering skills for the future is to seek the barriers piece, to look at the barriers that are stopping us, and that's the piece that the Chair is referring to in terms of what are the barriers and, and how can we collectively work yeah. together. But is the programme designed to acceler accelerate barrier planning? Absolutely, yes. Okay. I mean, I, I raise this because all politics is obviously local. Yes. Um, and for some time there's been talk of uh, the area plan for primary education in Greater Shankill, mm -hmm. which straddles uh, uh, North Belfast constituency yes. and West. Yes. And I know that I've been in meetings with officials, including Mr Irwin, about yes. this in the past. There has been no movement on that. And this has been talked about probably going back six, seven years. Yes, and I'm aware of the context of yeah. that. Yeah. But what, what actually happens then is, if I might use an example, we're sitting in a situation where Glenwood Primary School, which is the prime hub school for Greater Shankill, 550 pupils, the school is in an appallingly Dickensian state. They have windows that have no no no, no window panes in them. Uh, fungus growing on the inside of walls. Fungus growing from the floor. Classroom had to stop to be used because it was affecting the teacher's health. In terms of respiratory problems, uh, I mean, I, I have had officials from the department and the education authority at the school. I have sent a dossier of photographs in, but the state of the school, it's appalling. But it can't. It, it, there's been uh, talk of investment there uh, for some time. Part of the school is listed. Part of it isn't. It's an uh, appalling mm -hmm. rebuild of the 60s or 70s. So I think you're itching to answer the question, Mr. Well, well I'll, I'll give a little bit of background to say. Um, I mean, you, you're right. The issue around, I suppose, the, the that school and progressing the new build because it is on a new build list relates to area planning and, yeah. and sorting out the area planning yeah. uncertainties. My understanding is that um, there has been a lot of work going on in the background between 
the EA's area planning team and uh, the, the department. Uh, a business case is imminent with us. In fact, it has been in draft, I think, with our... I've been told it's been imminent for I, some time. I, 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 I know, and, problem. and we're not over the line yet. Um, my understanding is that and the, 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 the issues that were raised were all around area planning, as you know, we've had conversations in the past. My understanding is that the EA have not, are now proposing uh, an alternative solution to one that had been talked about maybe when... Uh, when, when we had met yourself, and that the, the, the economists within the department certainly um, are content that, that that proposal can now be taken forward. Having said that, back to your original point, it still needs then whatever the plan is to be implemented to allow the, 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 the project to, to move on. But in parallel, we have been, I think again as we agreed, we have been taking forward the, um, the technical feasibility work uh, around the, the school because it is also one of the most difficult projects to do. It's a big school on a constrained site. Uh, there are no other site alternatives that we've been able to identify uh, and it's going to be a particularly difficult project to, to implement uh, a new build for a school of that size while a school continues to operate on the site. But the technical feasibility work for that has been done and has informed the business case. So that work has been going on in the background but your original point, I suppose, still stands. It's going to need the area planning piece to be implemented. And I'd very briefly respect the care you've taken to attach this to the policy issue of area planning, but yeah. let, I would just ask for um, us to focus on the policy matter, yeah. or and, we may have a and, list of schools from all members no, coming no, for, forward but, here. But, 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 yeah, <laughs> but my, the point is, Chairman, with yep. respect, yep. It, 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 I absolutely understand that, that civil servants will come and set out the stall, particularly at the start of... Uh, the the uh, mandate as we are, are at, but practically on the ground for Mr. Wright and his staff in the school, for the pupils who who uh, attend that school, these are the difficulties of this policy not working. And my point is that the policy, when you when you talk about um, it, it's designed to accelerate area planning. You know, let's get on with that, Peter yes. Shankle. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because it's uh, the failure to actually develop area planning and take it forward has meant that this school has said, and others then are caught in the same, same problem across the city and across the country. Yeah. And I don't disagree with the views that you're expressing yeah. about the need to speed it up, absolutely. We need to be mindful of bringing stakeholders with us, and very often we need to make sure that the communities are content to move the process forward, which yes. is really what the barriers piece is around. It's about giving us more, I suppose, levers and tools to be able to close one stage down and move on to the next, to avoid that drift, if you like, that does creep in at each stage. But I, I totally accept the point that we want to speed things up. But just just finally, Sharon, I, I have written to the Minister about the situation, and I've invited him to the school to see at first hand the problem. I would encourage you just to, to make haste. Uh, where there hasn't been in the past. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chair, Karen Mull. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Sorry, you. I missed the start. Um, just a number of things. A review of home to school transport. Um, you talk about the options that are being explored um, and uh, looking at the PFD outcomes. Can I ask, uh, does those options include families who are on lower incomes? Because transport um, costs should not be a barrier to education. Would it be possible, Deputy Chair, if I take that question away today and come back to you? Yeah. The reason being that Fiona Hepper is my colleague, Deputy Secretary, and Fiona is unable to be with us today due to pre-arranged leave many months ago. So that is actually on her side. If you don't mind, I'll take it back and we'll get you an answer to that. And I just have a couple more that I didn't get of course, to yes. the Minister, yes. so you may have to come back to me as well. In relation to special education needs in Irish medium education, there is no learning support units in any Irish medium schools and no Irish medium specific assessment tools. Can, can you outline if, if the department has any plans to address this? Again, I'm really sorry, but I will take that away and we'll get back to yeah. you very quickly. And the other one you're probably going to have to come back is just in relation to, um, we're getting an update on saying in the next couple yes. of weeks, we will go into yes. more detail yes. there. But in relation to this week's announcement of the extra £10 million pound through the monitoring mm -hmm. round, at that um, briefing that we're going to be getting from yourselves, could we get a full uh, detail in terms of how that money is going to be allocated? Because yes. I know it's, you know it's a big budget, 
um, but how is that going to work out? How is it going to impact? How is it going to benefit schools? How is it going to benefit children? So if we can get the full details Absolutely, that, I'll the take, timelines around I will it. take that back. I mean, it, it, we will work in conjunction with our EA colleagues, who will be the people who are actually putting the money out into the system, but we will get you a breakdown for that, for that session. Thank it's you. a question that's been asked by many people, so mm -hmm. thanks for asking that, Deputy Chair, and, and we would be grateful for that level of detail and response. Thank you. Uh, Robbie Butler, MLA. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I've got a, a question on transformation and on the area planning. Um, so on transform, I'll ask them both, and then sure. you can just you can sure. refer back if that's okay. It's a skill I don't possess, by the way. So on transformation, um, I'm just thinking about um, uh, what work has been undertaken in terms of the project, perhaps, and I know it's limited in terms of the budget. Um, to look at technology as a useful vehicle for a 21st century approach, um, mm -hmm. not just to, to to education, but shared education specifically and the technology has moved that has allowed us to maybe not view shared education and go ahead as, as, as has normally been seen. And is there a specific piece of work that has been undertaken or is likely to be undertaken in that? And then uh, on the area of planning, um, when the Minister and the Permanent Secretary were in here, we talked about the area planning. And I, th I suppose area planning is not the destination because it's all, I, I imagine a, a degree of agility is going to need to be built into policies mm -hmm. and process. And one in particular, if you look at the temporary variation really? policy, it was described as clunky right. and inefficient. So is there any work that is being done to <coughs> develop policies that are going to be needed to be still embedded, but, uh, but much more agile um, to allow us to react uh, much quicker and more appropriately to change in demographics and, sure. and social needs? Yes. Okay, thank you for the questions. I'll start with the transformation question. And there is actually a, a dedicated project looking at education technology services, very much being led by the EA colleagues, but we work in conjunction with them, and that is looking at certainly Technical, technological solutions around things like recruitment, HR issues, um, messaging out to schools, stopping the big duplication of paperwork. So those are looking at a range of issues and we'd be happy to provide further details, but one of the projects is specifically looking at education technology services. And, and just to weave that into perhaps that, that shared education. Yes, yes, in the term, just, yes. We'll, yeah. we'll look at that okay. and take that forward. Okay. And the second question around the temporary variation policies, um, you're absolutely right to mention that. That's a, that's a clunky process for everyone concerned. Um, it, it interfaces very closely with the post-primary um, admissions, which is kicking off as, uh, last weekend. So where we are on that is we've tried to be more proactive this year on the post-primary admissions in terms of identifying where temporary variation may be needed um, but that's a sort of piecemeal exercise specifically for that year group we are going to be looking at a longer term policy area around the TV policy and seeing what can be done to um, make that more mainstream and one of the strands within the transformation project is actually looking at bringing schools admissions and enrolments numbers that have a historic pattern of being so mandatory in terms of you know settling the numbers like a resettling figure and that will also help that issue around high volume of tvs so there is work ongoing in that area at the moment um, and policy papers will come to the committee as they develop thank you okay uh, bring morris and then catherine in, and then we'll try and move on to gary's presentation yep thank you very thank much you. chair I, I will be brief and thanks very much for for coming uh, to the committee today uh, during the, the, the education transfer transformation program, uh, the, the, can you advise what do you mean by reducing admissions and enrolments at primaries to lower established normals? Is that a response to the current predicted lows that's going to happen in the future? There's going to Actually, be a reduction in, in, in primary school enrolment. That wasn't the main driver for doing the piece of work, mm -hmm. but it's probably like a byproduct <coughs> of it. But the driver for doing that piece of work was actually the fact that many schools were sitting with a, a sort of enrolment number much higher historically than ever they, they should have had. So there was benefit in doing an exercise, and we actually ran a pilot project with a certain amount of primary schools who volunteered to be involved, looking at just right-sizing them back down to, you know, historically, if they'd always been at a certain level, to right-size them down. Because where that comes into play is things like whenever they're applying for, for example, capital works programmes, you know, they look at the actual um, authorised um, enrolment numbers, if you like, 
and it, if it's not an accurate reflection of what the history of the school has been, and it's, it's false. So it's an exercise really just to right-size many of the schools that have been carrying the, the wrong numbers for a long time. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Okay, Morse. And Catherine and Kelly. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, Leanne, the tagline dis educational disadvantage group that was set up by the department in May 2017 to look at uh, um, educational underachievement is to present a paper to the minister. Um, can we, um, as a committee, get sight of this and weigh in? Yes. Um, I think I'd be fair in saying again, this is on Fiona's side, so I, I will need to clarify this with the team. But my full expectation is that once the Minister has had, this, has had the proposals and has had the space to consider his views on that, then absolutely I would imagine and envisage that we would be very happy to share that with the committee. So absolutely, I'll take that back to you, Fiona's side. For you. Justin McNulty. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your attendance to our committee today, folks. Um, just on the review of home to school transport, um, will that incorporate reconsidering the position whereby many parents whose children attend not the nearest school but bypass the nearest school who have to pay for their school transport and for families with a number of kids that can be very, very onerous on them and uh, I think it's something that needs to be reconsidered and re-looked at. Um, also on post-primary admissions, there's a bit of an anomaly in, in South Armagh, my own constituency, whereby children who have siblings at a grammar school who are sitting the 11 plus and who may not necessarily pass 11 plus have then, they have no school whose criteria they actually meet to gain access to that school. So I'd like a, you know, a deep dive look at the issue facing a number of parents in South Armagh, which is causing them no end of uh, dismay over recent months and years. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. On the first point on the home to school transport, I'll absolutely take that point away, similar to the previous question, and we will respond to that. On, on your second point around the South of our area, it's something that the department and colleagues and myself are very aware of, and as we enter this period of um, trying to allocate children to their school of choice, we will be very much having it in our minds. The one thing I would say is that the admissions policies of individual schools are determined by the schools themselves, as opposed to the department. So if, if there are sort of anomalies with admissions criteria, that isn't necessarily something that we would have much influence on. However, TVs and movement around the schools is something that we would be able to work, work with. So we are certainly have that in our minds. What's TV? Temporary variations where they, we determine that there's going to be a surge and if the school has the capacity from a capital infrastructure point of view, extra places can be put in just for that one year's admissions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, Thank Leon. We'll you. invite uh, Gary to brief us in terms of the finance picture, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's page 61 of table items, members. Thank you. I, I was just going to check if everybody has a copy of the slides or one a few extras. Yes, anybody doesn't. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm just going to provide a bit of context. You'll probably be familiar with a lot of this stuff before, and, and I've had conversations with somebody in the past, um, and the minister may have covered some of it, but to provide some context and then just to walk through some of the pressures that the department is likely to face next year and in future years. And then I also thought it would be useful to give just a, a quick run through what I've been doing in terms of the review of the Common Funding Scheme project. So just turn to the first slide, budget context, and I'm sure you'll have seen this quoted at different times. There's been a real terms reduction, as the graph uh, demonstrates, of about 229 million over the last 10, roughly the last 10 years, since 2010-11, um, which obviously has a significant impact. A lot of this has built up over time because uh, the budgets haven't been available for, for uh, pay rises for teachers and non-teaching staff to be funded. They, a lot of those still have to be met, non-teaching staff in particular, and incremental progression for teachers. So that has built up over the course of time. At the same time, over the same period, pupil enrolments have increased by about 17,000. So you, know, you can imagine the impact that that has across the sector. Special education needs has been referred to. It's, it's one area of ongoing uh, it's an ongoing issue for the department. It's something that we're constantly having to bid for, for additional resources in year, generally speaking, because of the costs are escalating. And the graph illustrates there where, you know, that level of increase over time 
and that, that is an ongoing increase and it's anticipated to, to continue in future years. There is work that the Education Authority is undertaking, sort of getting in under the, the figures and, and the drivers towards that and trying to refocus more. I mean, others will be able to talk in much more detail about it, but focusing more on early years and, you know, interventions uh, to try and avoid ongo you know, some of the ongoing costs, but obviously putting the needs of youngsters at the fore. The next slide, the budget context, school services and deficits. Um, again, this has been out in the public domain before. The number, numbers of schools uh, with a deficit has been increasing over time. And certainly last year, can't quote this year's figures yet, obviously, because there's a lot of factors impact on what the end year position will be. But certainly last year, there were over 440. And, you know, about 60 million in, in value terms. And the number of surpluses, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, schools do have the ability to retain some of their budgets in the form of surpluses and can draw down from those in the fu future. There are certain rules around that, and we have been able to bid for those resources, generally speaking, in year over the last few years, from a kind of a, a banked amount that's held in the Department of Finance. But again, those are reducing, deficits are increasing, and just in the last couple, couple of years, really, you know, the balance has tipped and there's actually more deficits now than surpluses. And the next slide just gives a, a, a visual, I suppose, presentation of the split of the department spend. Very often the uh, comments are made about that there's not enough goes directly to schools. And yes, there is a discussion to be had around that, exactly what goes to schools. But I think this does illustrate that Really, the majority of funding does make its way to schools. There's the aggregated schools budget that is about 60% of the whole. That's the amount that goes directly th via the formula to schools. And then there's, there's what's known as the Education Authority Block Grant, which covers uh, a number of areas of spend, the big ones being special education needs, special schools, rates, substitution costs, transport costs, etc. And there's a number of other earmarked funds covering school maintenance, preschool education programme, extended schools, etc. And I'll not go through them all, but that, I suppose, is just an illustration that there's a lot of that spend that's held at education authority level that does make its way to schools in some form. Looking on then to next year, um, the pressures, I think the Minister did allude to this, are quite substantial. Looking at next year, this slide focuses, I suppose, on our, on our starting position before the uh, New Deal, I've forgotten its title, New Deal, New, new Decade, New Approach, <laughs> took a mental black. New uh, we, we've abbreviated now in the department in our own way. Um, not taking count of those, that these are the, the pressures that we were, we were looking at having to bid for for next year. So again, I'll pick out some of the big ones. I think the Minister's already referred to the teacher, teaching and non-teaching pay. Now that, that includes uh, a 68 million that would potentially cover the, a pay settlement for the last two years, and then there's an ongoing uh, pressure every year, follow-on pressure of about 40 million. So for next year, that covers 40 million this year and 40 million uh, next year. Education Authority, uh, they, are, they face ongoing pressures. Now, a lot of those are particularly linked 32 million uh, and the 44 million, a lot of those are linked to special education needs, as you can see. So it's, it's a big area, it's a big issue uh, in line with the inclusion policy. School maintenance is always an ongoing issue and it's a difficult one for us to handle when budgets are constrained. And even the conversation earlier about a particular school, there, there's always ongoing issues um, and yet there's a very limited budget that the Education Authority has to work from. And we have actually asked them to constrain that budget over the last few years, but obviously come to us if there's a crisis occurring. So it's just an illustration of some of the difficulties of managing things when budgets are constrained. The 16.5 million is previously, it relates to previously allocated money from the confidence and supply funding, which was very helpful. Didn't, didn't actually enable the department or the education authority to do anything new, but it underpinned a lot of the work that was already being done. And it, I suppose it saved Derek at that time, having to make decisions uh, to cut certain services. So uh, 
I'm not, I don't know whether to go through them all, maybe pick up any questions if people have them, but that, that covers all the, the main areas of spend before we take kind of some additional areas that are in the new agreement document. Uh, now, some of these, as you'll see, delivering, delivering the child care strategy, uh, development of the mental health and emotional well-being framework, you know, some of these will depend on policy decisions that will be taken further to down the line. So, you know, there are estimates of costs that, that might materialise. They might be more, more than not, depending on the policy decisions that are taken. Yeah, I would say briefly, though, Gary, they, they are extremely likely pressures. They're not hoped for. Likely Alex, pressures, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, and some of them are quite modest assessments in terms of a delivery of a childcare <coughs> strategy for Northern Ireland. £15 million pounds is definitely yeah. the lower end of yeah. what would be required to deliver on yeah. new data. And there is another slide. Approach commitments, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's another slide that covers some of the options, okay. which okay. I'll you know, not go into detail. It was meant yeah. more as a, by way of illustration, just to back up your point there. I suppose it's getting the balance when we're bidding for resources, you know, because the, you know, the executive's budget as a whole is under pressure, so we have to take a kind of a balanced view of what's reasonable and obviously there will always be options and more resources may have to be bid for. Then moving to the next slide, it covers some of the additional areas that specifically relate to the, the text in the agreement document. Uh, resourcing pressures in schools, um, that specifically covers you know, some of the other costs that we've covered such as pay, those are new pressures. The 60 million referred to here is really the ongoing build-up of a pressure in schools, which really has built up over time, with pay pressures in particular not, not having been funded. And that's what we estimate we'd need to go into the aggregated schools budget just to kind of balance things. And then there's the, the independent review that's referred to. That, that's an estimate of what, what it might cost, you know, in terms of uh, people to lead that review, really the secretariat function and uh, some other factors there, and educational underachievement. That's, that's linked again to some policy decisions that we required, linked to a uh, replacement for the extended schools funding, um, partners in education, and uh, also we've estimated what the cost might be of, an, of establishing an Ulster Scots and Irish language uh, NDPB, if you like, to take that forward. And that's, so, so some of these, you'll understand where we're coming from when we're estimating costs. It can be difficult to exactly quantify what the needs are, but we, we have to put in our best estimate at a point in time. So the next slide sort of brings all of that together in terms of future pressures. So next year, we're really talking about an estimated overall pressure of over 400 million, and that would rise in three years to, to over 700 million. And again, there's a lot of assumptions, as I've said, within this, this figure work. Uh, moving to the next slide, teachers' pay. It was obviously referred to in the document as well. I think it's already been alluded to. Teachers' pay bill is about $1.1 the, uh, And obviously, we have, we have put a business case to the Department of Finance. It's been sitting with them for some time. Uh, not because they're reticent to approve it, necessarily, but because it is obviously linked to the, the need for funding and uh, certainly before the re-establishment of the, the Assembly. Uh, Derek, as, as Permanent Secretary, was always very straight about this, that we, you know, there'd be no point in a, an agreement being uh, settled if there's no funding for it, because we'd just be presenting more of a problem onto the, the sector. So that, that business case won't be finalised and improved until finance has been allocated yeah. to it? Yeah, that's what has held, held it up to date. Okay, and you're aware that the action short of strike is ongoing in the meantime. There has been agreement in principle, which is helpful. The proposed settlement, just to give you the background, 68 million refers to a 2.2% increase, proposed increase in 1718, and then a 2.25% 2, 2 increase in 1819. But the 189 figure, 19 figure is a cumulative figure, so it, it obviously has to take account of the 2% of the previous year, so it's 68 for that amount to settle those two years. And then the ongoing cost uh, would be about 40 million each year, and that that assumes that would assume a 1% increase each year after that. Any incremental progression that teachers are entitled to, as well as uh, pay to non-teaching staff, which is uh, nationally negotiated on the whole. 
And then moving on to the next slide, school finances. Uh, we've I think I've already covered that really. The only aspect I haven't mentioned really is that additional send pressure linked to new send framework. And this has actually formed part of the work within the review of the Common Funding Scheme project. We've been looking at, at send funding generally. Um, but one aspect in particular is the potential, you know, the need for the new framework and introducing the changes that would be required with that, such as learning support coordinators for each school, and a recognition that you know it's not realistic to go forward with some of these things without the funding. So I have always been supportive of the need to bid for additional funding for that. There's obviously there's an expectation that schools will address a number of the special education needs within their delegated budgets, but for something new like this, there's a recognition that more money is required. <coughs> Childcare strategy I'm going to skip over because I don't want you asking me any detailed questions about it because I, I wouldn't be. <laughs> in I just wanted to put that there, I think, to illustrate your point, Chair, you know, that the costs, it's, it's hard to, to estimate exactly what the cost might be for some of these things. And then covering some it's of the other... It's certainly likely to be higher than £15 million that you've modestly estimated, mm -hmm. but yeah, OK. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think I've covered those other areas. Do you want to... Pause there before I go through the other set of slides, or do you want me to? Yeah, maybe maybe we on? can take some questions on that. Um, I suppose that the, the first one is as the um, official in charge of this. How concerned are you by the scale of that pressure? Four hundred and twenty-seven million pounds is roughly a, a quarter of your budget. Yeah. No. Uh, very concerned. Yeah, and I suppose I've. Uh, I've always, I'm always open on my advice up the line to Derek before the, ex the uh, executive was re-established and now to the Minister about the reality of the pressures. Uh, and, I, and I suppose back to the earlier conversation about estimating you know, some of what some of the policy changes might cost, trying to be cognizant of the fact as well that the pressures are facing the whole executive, the whole executive's budget, and I suppose we, we have had to live within budgets that we have been given over the last few years as best we can. That has been challenging. Uh, we will always, and from my point of view, I'll always highlight what I believe the pressures are, but they are based, you know, they're based on certain assumptions and everybody has to live within the budgets they have, but they, they are probably, I think, even this year, the situation I think has become worse in terms of what the Education Authority is forecasting as potential overspend, and I think that is because a lot of the the non-funding of pay and price pressures over the years has really come home to roost. Okay, what is the Education Authority's pressure? It's not, um, I mean, they are, they are forecasting certain figures potentially up to, we bid for pressures of 67 million in the monitor, recent monitoring round, so they're a lot higher than you know, the, the position that the Education Authority ended up with in previous years. So there are concerns around that. Um, but I think a lot of that is linked, you know, that they have done their best to absorb certain pressures in previous years, and now it's getting more and more difficult. And I think it's been the assumption when budgets have been allocated as well that, you know, pay pressures that the Education Authority is obliged to pay, such as incremental pro progression and non-teaching staff pay. It's, it's been that assumption over the last few years that those will, that the budget will, man the department will will manage that, but you know that, that hasn't been easy. It was part of the budget strategy, obviously, to keep the focus on frontline services and to absorb pay pressures, but realistically, it couldn't go on forever, and it's increasingly coming through. It has been coming through in increasing <coughs> deficits and reducing surpluses over the last few years, but I think it's getting worse now. How will the department meet these pressures, and what are the implications of not? Well, again, if the, uh, we're, we're grateful for the money that we got in year, obviously, which will be allocated quickly. But uh, certainly, that, that's the last monitoring round of the year. So it, obviously, it depends on how everything lands at the end of the year, exactly what any potential overspend might be. But it does look like there will be another overspend this year, which is no, it's not the position that any, any of us as officials want to be in. What are the implications of that for the education system? But I think un unless, uh, and, and even linked to the review of the Common Funding Scheme project that I've come to, 
you know, no matter what you look at, without additional funding going into the sector, it's, it's very difficult. Even, even in transformation terms, it can be very difficult to take forward serious change without some money going in just to cover the, the basics, you know, at school level. Okay, um, William Humphrey wants to ask a question. Um, thank you. Um, Guy, thanks very much for your presentation. Can I just ask, in terms of the NDNA commitments, um, in particular addressing linkages between education and underachievement and the socio-economic backgrounds, and the, in terms of the budget context, you mm -hmm. talked about special education and needs monies. Yeah. Um, can I ask, um, because I agree entirely with your point that early intervention is better, more effective, and more cost effective. Mm -hmm. Um, what priority has the department placed on a joined up approach across um, government on these issues with other government departments, government agencies, agencies and local government to achieve economies of scale and reduce wastage? Uh, to be honest, I couldn't really answer that in an informed way. We might be better coming back to you and that'll have a, a conversation with my policy colleague on that. I mean, I know that there is joint working with the Department of Health, for instance, and that there would department itself is, works very closely with the Education Authority as the main provider for a lot of the services, but I uh, prefer to come back with a more informed answer. Yeah, I think that, that's okay. important because if we, you know, we're talking about the budgets we're talking about here across yeah. all the schools, yeah. a significant amount of money, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I always just get the impression, uh, and certainly through my own work, um, probably more than, than an impression, that the joined upness and collaboration can always be better, right. uh, and I think that's something which we need to get much more um, efficient at uh, uh, to, to drive for those economies of scale and, and saving. Yeah. Because the savings, I don't mean savings as in, savings mean that there's reinvestment in, in, in areas where, because of the huge budgetary pressures you have, yeah. um, money is needed right across the, the, uh, the department and all of the areas yeah. of government. I mean, the Education Authority would probably be best place to comment on that, but we'll come back with you. Yeah, okay, thanks. An answer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Deputy Chair, Karen Mullen. Thank you, Gary. Um, just following on from, from William's point, um, uh, I suppose we we need to see that. We, there, this is cross cutting. We have a number of strategies um, mentioned in the, in the New Deal document for moving forward. Um, so we need the other gov we need the departments to be working together. We need them in investing, particularly when you're looking at an anti-poverty strategy. You're looking at children and young people. So I suppose maybe in the next couple of weeks or months we'll see that detail coming out. But I would say that um, our departments have a huge role to play in this, both financially and, and otherwise. So we'll, we'll maybe follow up on that. Um, just really, I suppose if you go back to the the deficits. Mm -hmm. And um, just, um, you know, around, is there a plan in the department or an intent to assist schools that have huge um, budgetary deficits? And it takes me back to what William was saying. And in our, on our own areas, we can all talk about um, schools that's there. But in particularly the schools that are in buildings, like William has described, in relation, they're, they're sitting with a deficit, a large yeah. deficit, um, because they're trying to fix these windows and everything else. It's, you know, and it's sucking up all the money. They're not going to get to the stage where they meet the criteria. So, um, you know, moving forward in terms of, you know, having sustainable school core budgets, it's around those schools that have these deficits, legacy deficits that's been there. That's enormous. They'll never be able to do it. So, you might not be able to give us the answer today, but we'd be interested in going forward. You know, what the plan is to support those schools. Uh. Well, I suppose there's two factors. It's, uh, some of the schools would be wrapped up in the area planning process. Obviously, there, there could be delays there that are causing, you know, where there's no resolution really to the deficit position for some schools. The other aspect, obviously, is the need for additional funding. Um, I mean, I have worked hard alongside the Education Authority in the last few years, and we've been engaging a lot with schools. And my view is, and you'd be aware, I suppose, from letters that I have written to schools in the past, uh, ensuring there's good financial management. From my point of view, uh, in developing bids, departments' bids, and seeking additional resources from the centre, uh, 
it has been important from my point of view to get an assurance that there is good financial management out there. And I think there's been a lot of good work done. Uh, I know it's been stressful for a lot of school principals and school leaders, but a lot of good work has been done. Oh, yeah. uh, there's never been a pressure where uh, a school that is doing everything that it can do and is still forecasting a deficit. I think the assurance that, that we have sought is that they're doing everything they can do. Uh, so it's not, you know, schools, I don't, I don't believe that schools have been put under undue focus in that respect, but it doesn't solve the problem, as you say, and the longer term solution really is additional funding into the sector. It's that legacy to stabilize. Yeah. Well, maybe I know in my area, a principal has come in and she's doing everything, but yeah. she just can't get it down. Yeah building is crumbling around her um, yeah. and we've made representations on it but yeah. there's quite a number on that and, and I think everybody here could say it. And then um, just really the last point would be uh, will the contingency fund be replaced? Sorry? The contingency fund that was there in the past for Rowan schools I think was there? In your growth uh, yeah, money? Was, yes, well that would still be applied by the education authorities right. so decisions if they haven't already been made yeah. would be made during the course of the year. Uh, some, I think some uh, times the Education Authority will hold off maybe till later in the year just to see how everything lands and, and it has been challenging for the, from the Education Authority's point of view just trying to, to do their utmost to balance their books. They have their own challenges. We have, obviously part of my role is to, to ch challenge them and what they're doing so we have all been working together to try and manage everything as well as we can within the resources that we have but additional resources. There's no question additional resources are required and, and that £60 million that's referred to as an additional NDNA cost is really linked to the, the sort of accumulated deficit position at school level. Thank you. Okay. okay. Gary, do, do you believe that the UK Government or the Northern Ireland Executive are going to allocate £427 million to the Department of Education? Well, I suppose my... Uh, I, I know that the executive will do everything in their power to secure whatever additional resources are required. I suppose we all have to be realistic. I have no idea what the final figure might be. Uh, my job is to highlight the pressures as as they are and bid for them and see where that takes us to. And then ultimately, I suppose, whatever the conclusion of the budget discussions are, we have to find a way forward, as we've done in previous years. And if, well, if you're not allocated that... Can the Northern Ireland Executive or the Department of Education do anything differently to reduce the pressure that will be incurred by not receiving that total? No, not, nothing significant, certainly in the short. I mean, obviously transformation might, could well bring savings into the future, but a lot of that is medium to longer term. It's very difficult to, to know this. I mean, I, I think as has been said before, because of the scale of the budget that is pay, it's very, very difficult to to make a big impact whenever those pressures aren't being met. Okay. Um, Robbie Butler. Thank you so much. And, um, numbers wasn't my strong point in school, but um, you've certainly kept me uh, pretty, uh, pretty well briefed here in, in terms of, uh, of the pressures especially. So um, you talked about the sort of in-year pressures for 2021, 426.5 million, and uh, I can see that and it's some very important work in there, and I'd echo what the Chair said. With regard to the child care strategy, but more importantly for me, the mental health, the emotional uh, well-being piece. But what struck me was that uh, you'd sort of hinted at uh, perhaps somewhere around an 80% increase um, in the following years. Somewhere, I think you mentioned maybe the pressures could be somewhere oh, sorry, yes, rising. 700, yeah. 750 million pounds. Now, not for a detailed uh, look at why there would be that significant increase, but would it, is it going to be tied in around the transformation piece, or is it predominantly pay related do you think well a lot of a lot of the pressures that have been identified for next year there's a cumulative uh, uh, an ongoing recurrent impact of that and okay. that can you know but will very often increase the cost then in future years pay for example you know you fund if this if the 148 is made available for next year there's still the 40 million recurring impact so there's you know there's there's this recurrence and special educational needs forecast expenditure continues to increase at this stage and obviously that's an area that the education authority will be giving some focus to but <coughs> the, the forecasts at the moment are that you know there's a lot of areas of spend continue to increase transport costs etc would, would, would you like 80 percent just seems to be a, 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 quite a 
Uh, no, sorry, I wasn't saying 80, an 80% 80 no, increase. Uh, it, when I referred to 80%, I was referring to the, the uh, proportion of our budget that is linked to staff costs primarily. Oh, sorry, no, I am, I'm, I'm just doing this calculation from the 426 to the 700, 750 million pounds. Oh, right, okay. That's, that's 80% yeah. I'm referring sorry. to in my right. sort of calculations. It's yeah. um, pretty reasonably robust, yeah. I would imagine. It just seems to be yeah. a large shift. It is, it is, and as has been pointed out, it's probably prudent in some ways because you know you you could go a lot higher depending on on policy certain policy decisions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. okay thanks, Member Gary. Do you want to briefly refer to the common funding yes. scheme review? Conscious, yeah. conscious of your time, so I'll skip over quite quickly. So I've I've been leading uh, some work, and and the, uh, basically. This all stemmed, I suppose, from some of the engagement events that we've been running with schools and feedback that we've had from principals and boards of governors. That there have been concerns for some years around the way the common funding scheme works, and whether it is, uh, you know, operating as it was intended to be, to be fair and equitable, and all the rest. So that I start, started led on some internal work. Obviously, when there was no assembly, no executive. Had to be careful how we handled that, so we referred to it as an internal desktop review initially. And then, when the department was successful and got some additional money for the transformation, it was then formalised as a project within the transformation programme. And that was formalised earlier in 2019. Uh, let's see. And the, the overall objective, I suppose, were to revisit how schools are funded to ensure that the school, school underpins and supports education policy, and to provide a suite of evidence-based options or proposals for consideration of an education minister. Now, none of this is, I'm sure you'll understand, none of this is straightforward, and I know some of us have had conversations about this before. That every area you look at, there will always be winners and losers, and therefore nobody, not everybody's ever going to be happy with any proposed changes. What we aim to do, I suppose, in that period of time without a minister was to do what we could to examine certain areas and gather some evidence together, do some modelling to see what options might be available to review certain areas. Now, SEND funding was one aspect that we, we looked at. Our main focus in the end and the paper that has been produced for consideration by the minister, the minister hasn't considered any of the work that we have done in detail yet. Uh, that was primarily focused on the introduction of the new uh, framework. Uh, but as part of that work as well, we also work closely with the Education Authority to ensure at least that special educational needs uh, requirements are, are better recorded, that there's more consistency across the, the five Education Authority regions. So there's been quite a lot of work uh, in terms of verifying costs and, and making the call, you know, so that they're delivering to us information that's more robust. Um, there are other aspects that we've been considering are rationalising the formula itself. The formula is quite complex. There's 19 factors within it. There's two funding streams, primary and nursery and post-primary. So we've been given some consideration. The factors have built up over time, sometimes the, the decisions of previous ministers or whatever. And it's, it's honouring the, the intention behind those, but looking at any way to see if there's, there's ways of streamlining those and making it more straightforward and ensuring that the money for certain purposes is actually delivering as an originally intended to. Uh, targeting social needs is, is some work that we've begun in conjunction with policy colleagues. Now, obviously, it, it is likely to be impacted as well by the, the uh, new agreement document and, and the commitments within it. And we've been liaising with the Irish medium sector as well, just to see that they obviously have some particular needs that they've asked us to consider, and we've been discussing those with uh, CNG colleagues. Um, we've been we've held two engagement sessions to date, uh, which I think have been useful. We've had very useful discussions, focused discussions, uh, representatives from sectoral bodies, principals, boards of governors. So there's been quite an openness in the discussion, but. I've had, had to handle this quite carefully because we didn't want it to be perceived that we were going out to consult, consult at a time when there was no assembly, no executive, no minister. And really, our next goal, I suppose, prior to the minister being appointed, we've been working towards having kind of a, what we called a co-design, the equivalent of a draft consultation document. We're working to have something prepared, hopefully by the end of February, for the minister's consideration. Now, again, this, this could well be impacted by the independent review that's been referred to, 
in the document and, and other factors. The Minister will have his own views on whether we would go out to consult at this stage. There are other policy reviews still ongoing, which could have an impact on the work that we're doing. So a judgment would need to be a judgment call, sort of early March, really, once the Minister has had time to consider. But I suppose that the main point I would make is that we've been taking seriously the issues that have been raised by schools uh, around concerns to do with the formula, and we have been given some serious thought to it all and trying to gather together an evidence base. Thanks for that, Gary. It, it, is a, it is a serious matter that's raised with us as MLAs yes. regularly, so it, it's welcome that that piece of work has been done in, in advance of the restoration of a minister, and hopefully with the minister in place, that will yes. assist you to make pace yeah. in relation to progress and, on that. And subject so, to the minister's views, I'm more than happy to give committee an update. Okay, thanks. Um, we we'll move on then to uh, John Smith, uh, Deputy Secretary, and Philip Irwin, Director of Investment and Infrastructure, with regards to the capital programme update for the committee. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, as you've alluded to, this is a, a going to be a bit of a double act. The Struel Shared Education Campus is a standalone programme within the department, and John looks after that, and I'll hand over to him after I've given you a, an overview of the wider capital programme. If you have the slides in front of you, I'll, I'll go through this fairly fairly quickly. Um, yeah, and that's page 71 in tabled uh, pack for members. Thanks, Philip. Okay. So uh, the, the wider capital programme I've divided there into to five different uh, categories. Major works, which are in the main new builds for schools. Uh, those are, have, have two strands of funding, uh, one from the executive and one from the fresh start. Um, there's then the school enhancement programme, which is for uh, investments between half a million and four million pounds. Those are inclined to be investments on existing school sites. Uh, the smaller projects then fall under the minor works, projects that are less than half a million. We also have a youth capital stream where we uh, make investments in both controlled and voluntary youth settings, and then have a catch-all there of other capital. Uh, that covers a variety of different things, but the main spenders in that area are inclined to be IT and transport, effectively buses for the, the Education Authority. The table on the next slide shows the breakdown by programme of the budget, and you'll see the overall executive funded budget is £157 million in the year, uh, and we would anticipate under fresh start in this particular year spending uh, £12.4 million. So we'll uh, have a quick uh, explanation maybe of, of each of the different programmes. Um, we start with major works, uh, an explanation of how a project gets selected to, to, to be on the major works list. The, pro the process is initiated by the department uh, making a call for proposals uh, to the, ma the school's managing authorities. They forward a long list to us. Um, there's an initial gateway process applied which is basically to try and remove ineligible applications, and that's usually around the sustainability of the school or area planning issues, um, such as were alluded to earlier. The schools that get through that process are then scored against a variety of different criteria. Um, their contribution towards rationalisation, the standard of their existing accommodation, the suitability of their existing accommodation, in other words, what um, uh, elements of the, the handbook are they missing, uh, the degree to which the schools reliant on temporary accommodation and then some smaller scores for social factors such as the percentage of free school meals, the percentage of uh, level 5 SEM pupils in the, in the school. The output of that then is a, a series of prioritised lists and the Minister, in light of whatever budget is deemed to be available or our ability to deliver, will then make an announcement of projects to uh, proceed in planning on the basis of that prioritisation. Since 2012, when that process was introduced, there have been four different announcements covering some 63 schools. And uh, I've shown there on the next slide the, the status of those, those projects. 23 complete, eight currently on site or contractor appointed, and another 31 of the business case or an, or an early <coughs> stage. I've also included there on the next slide a, a, a profile of historical spend on major works and projected spend. And I just want to make a couple of points on that. There's been a lot of focus in the department in trying to accelerate the, the major works programme. And as you'll see from the graph, that hit a, a major snag towards the end of 2017 when we had a significant number of projects that went to uh, procurement, construction procurement, and came back 
uh, at, a, at a much higher cost than we had uh, anticipated and that we had business case approval for. Uh, the subsequent work to relook at business cases or to relook at the projects um, re resulted in that drop in, in major capital spend. But I suppose the point that I wanted to highlight was that because of that, there is now a, a major bulge in the pipeline of, of major works, which um, are at later stages of design. That design will get finished and they'll go to procurement through next year. And we would anticipate that the demand from major works for capital over the subsequent years will increase significantly. I'll come to that again at the, at the end. That bulge in the pipeline, if you like, further through at the design stage has left uh, a more depleted uh, pipeline at the front end. For that reason, the department issued a call for further major works uh, announcement back in the autumn. We have the lists of schools that have been forwarded by the managing authorities. We're in the process of doing the survey work to allow us to do the scoring. Uh, we would hope that's completed by early March and we'd be in a position to make, or the Minister would be in a position to make an announcement of a further list of projects to advance the planning uh, before the end of the financial year or, or very shortly thereafter. We would need to see sight of a, a, a budget going forward to, to make an informed decision on that, but I'm assuming that within that time frame we should, should have some visibility of, of forward capital budgets. As I've said, the, the <coughs> round of major works, that's Fresh Start. Um, they're selected on a different basis. Uh, the, the, the aim of those projects was to increase the number, numbers of children from different communities and religious backgrounds being educated together. The approvals process for that is extremely convoluted and, uh, and difficult. Uh, it's three stages and involves approval of DE, DOF, Treasury and NIO at each of the stages. Uh, so an approval in principle, approval to planning, and then approval to construction, um, which is, uh, makes, it, makes it difficult to expedite projects um, quickly. I have listed then in the table below that all of the projects that have been announced uh, under Fresh Start and the stage that they are at. I think, Chair, you had also asked for some more detail with individual projects. So somewhere in your pack, there should be a little charts with green bars on it, projects down the side and the uh, stage of delivery across the top that, that uh, 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 deals with each individual project. That's at page 51 for members. Thanks, Philip. Okay, that takes us on to the school enhancement programme then, the SEP, uh, which as I say is, uh, or relates to projects between half a million and four million pounds. Uh, the pro process for selection there is pretty much identical to the major works. Um, we're now on to our second, second SEP programme. The first one was very successful in terms of delivery of projects in a, an expeditious manner. 50 projects announced, uh, almost all complete. I think there are two still on site and, and one on hold. Uh, in May 2018 then, the SEP 2 uh, announcement was made, or a first tranche. There have been two subsequent announcements uh, and some 59 projects now progressing through, uh, through SEP 2. Um, one point to highlight is that, there are, that the, the list of prioritised projects for SEP remains live. There are 106 projects still on that list. Uh, however, it will close uh, two years after the initial announcement, which is May 2020, May this year. Um, and there'll be a judgment call to be made by the Minister then as to whether or not we can announce um, any further projects off that list or whether the slate will be wiped clean and we'll have to move on to a, to a third uh, set programme at some point. Uh, the minor works then operates a slightly different way. We'd move to a system where schools make applications directly online themselves. Um, we were somewhat swamped by the number of applications we received in the last call, which was November 17. <coughs> Those are categorised in a slightly different way, as I've shown in the slide there, under three priorities. Uh, statutory, which are inclined to be health and safety, fire risk type projects. Uh, priority two, which relates really mainly to commission. <coughs> and priority three uh, around suitability. Um, however, there is a mechanism where urgent schemes that have not been submitted at the, the call can, if you like, leapfrog the priority twos and threes and, and get done. I suppose the takeaway message there is there is a huge 
amount of unmet demand for minor works out in the, the system. Uh, however, the other side of that is, you know, we as a department have spent all of the capital we have been allocated, certainly since I have been in the department, and acceleration of any one of these programmes by default, given we have a fixed pot of money, will mean we'd have to slow some of the others down. So it's a prioritisation issue between the different programmes. The Youth Capital Programme is, is uh, a stream on its own right. We uh, typically invest around about £10 million a year in youth capital. Um, slightly different process. Uh, the applications are made directly by the youth organisations. Uh, there's an eligibility check. Are they registered with the EA? Are they, can they demonstrate a track record of delivering youth service? Uh, and, and then they are uh, prioritised and scored in a similar way. So there are 30 of 47 applications that have been announced and are, are proceeding. And again, that proceeds within that sort of budget uh, constraint of about, about £10 million a year. And the final area then of, of other capital, as I said, relates mainly to transport and ICT. Uh, again, if you average out the last number of years, it's around about uh, £10 million a year we've been spending in that area. At the point I wanted to make, at the bottom point on that slide, um, there are a number of business cases in the system that will have big demands on capital from, in both in terms of ICT, and I haven't listed it on the slide, but transport as well, uh, replacement bus um, uh, business case, which will have a, a big demand <coughs> on our capital requirement in the, the, the uh, business or the review period going forward. And you couple that with the major works and the SEPs that <coughs> start to be going on site at the same time, there is a potential issue there around our ability to deliver all of this within the budget that, uh, that uh, we're allocated. Albeit we haven't seen yet what the budget is, so I'm, I'm maybe speaking ahead of I'm, I'm identifying a problem before it, uh, it actually occurs. Okay. That's all I wanted to say with the wider capital. I'll hand over to John then can on I, school. Can I maybe just oh, sorry, take ahead. questions for, yeah, yeah. for yourself, sure. Philip, there, and we'll try, we'll, we'll try to be concise. Um, the, initially, in terms of the Fresh Start major works, um, not the single in on a particular college, but just my, my familiarity with the, the college at Priory Integrated College, it's, at, it's listed here as projects approved to planning stage two. Um, my, my understanding is that it was initially announced for fresh start allocation in 2015, is that right? Yeah. About five years ago, so I suppose my question... 16 maybe, but 26. It, was, it was in the initial announcement. My, yes. my, my question is why does it take four, five years to progress only to approve the planning? Well, the, 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 the process of, if you like, uh, categorising what, um, how... how project moves through the different stages. I mean, we were probably two years in uh, debate with uh, the various different parties that are, that are listed around agreeing that process. Um, having said that, uh, there are, I suppose, a number of, of projects that were slow out of the marks that, that you know, from uh, our delivery point of view, the EA delivery point of view, I think we would would all agree uh, are, are slower than we would, would like. Um, the, the main issue with those ones probably was capacity. There, there were 23 of these projects announced simultaneously on day one, and to some extent uh, we, we have a certain capacity to move them forward, and that one and a, a few others you could probably name uh, uh, were in a similar situation that they were, they were slow out of the marks. Out of the blocks. Uh, is there a, a concerted effort to increase the pace of the delivery? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I mean, I think the consultant team for that particular one, uh, well, if I, I've sent you the update. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean in general as well, obviously, because yeah, yeah, no, no, not, I mean, not the narrowing. I probably spent 80% of my time trying to speed all of this up. Okay. When we look and analyse where the delays occur, they're going <coughs> to be across a number of themes, but in, in many, many different areas. Okay. And, you know, we... we we, as I say, the focus on speeding these up uh, is, is definitely there. Okay. In terms of the school enhancement programme, is there likely to be a SEP2 tranche for? Um, I would say again that, well, number one, we do need to see what budget uh, and a budget projection, indicative budget even, out over three or four years, which I think will be part of the process over the next few months with the, the executive and with Westminster. Um, my feeling would be that our system is at capacity in terms of 
uh, of progressing projects uh, immediately. However, it'll be a decision for the minister, but it might be that further projects could get announced, but the, the slate would then be wiped clean. We, we, we'll do what we said in the original protocol, close it after two years. Um, but the schools may, we, we may be able to announce some projects and knowledge that it may be a number of months before we get to, to the projects themselves and initiate them. As William alluded to earlier, there are multiple schools across Northern Ireland in serious, serious states of disrepair. Well, I mean, I don't disagree. And, uh, you know, there, no matter what happens, we will not be announcing 106, which are, are in the prioritised lists, uh, because we simply do not have either the money nor the capacity to do all of those. And it is a continual balancing act between a fixed pot of money and how much of it do you allocate towards new builds and major works, how much towards SEPs, and how much to, to, to minor works. Okay. Uh, and, and the feeling has always been the more we could, if you like, balance or bias the spend towards the new projects and the SEPs, um, it would, if you like, almost reduce the demand for the minor works as well. Um, the, there's a, you know, minor works are inclined to be sticking plasters, which are maybe dealing with short-term issues, whereas if we, can, if we can accelerate the major works and the SEPs, that in the longer term, that would ha be a more beneficial way to, to invest the money, albeit there are schools, as you say, that, that need the money immediately. Okay. I'm going to bring members in quickly. Just very last question linked to that is, in terms of the strategic review of procurement, is, is that in response to sustained concern from schools with regards to the EA centrally controlled procurement process for minor works? I, I think that's probably uh, more in relation to maintenance works than, than minor works. Um, I mean, there, there's, there can be overlap between the two, but um, the process of undertaking maintenance works is entirely different from anything I've, I've said there. It's, as Gary said, resource um, budget on, on maintenance rather than capital. Um, and I think, well, I know the EA have undertaken significant consultation with schools and with a variety of stakeholders, and it's probably in relation to those consultations that they have sought to okay. change the way they deliver the... Okay, bring uh, William Humphrey in. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Philip, for your presentation. Just in terms of um, transport there, uh, you talk about 10 million plus per annum in recent years, and then you have a figure down below that uh, transport and ICT combined requirement of 70 plus. Is that pretty well, in fact, the 70 only related to, to, I think I didn't mention transport in that slide, but I mentioned it in the presentation. That 70 million is, though, is over a number of years now, to be fair, but for those three capital projects alone, mm -hmm. or those three IT projects alone. Right. Um, so there's a, I think, I so, think it's a 15 so it's million 70, pound. 70 plus per annum? No, that's a, a 70 million pounds over three-year period, the next three years, if those business cases were approved right, okay. straight away. But there is, on, on top of that, a significant transport uh, capital requirement. And I, I, I can't quote the figure I to you. To, but I just want to go on to transport. <clears throat> I mean, what size is the EA's fleet? I couldn't give you the, the detail. Take it, take it, it, it's paid for by the taxpayer entirely. Uh, or are these buses leased? It's funded by capital from... Right. The department so, allocates to right. the, the so, education so, authority. So the department gives the money to the EA who buy the buses. Yeah. Right. So uh, these are these are outright. So government buys them. Government has to maintain them. Correct. Keep them on the road. We're in terror depreciation. That's an absolute loss being written off each year. I mean, has the department looked at um, having the same number of buses but leasing them? Um, the savings that potentially could be made there. Well, um, there, there is a business case that is coming in relation to the replacement of, of the, the, the current bus fleet. Uh, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if leasing has been looked at as an option in that. One point I would highlight is um, if, if the buses were leased, that would not be a capital issue at all. That would then become a resource pressure, and mm. you've already heard about the... the yeah pressures that exist on yeah, the resource fair, side of the house. Fair enough, but if it provide, pro present, provides a saving to government, is that not something yeah, which the civil yeah. servant should look at? Yeah, I, I, if, if, yeah, if it presented a saving to government. I, mean, I, saving I mean, could you come back to, to us on that? I mean, uh, surely the, at some point there must have been a piece of work done that looks at outright of buying the vehicles, whatever the size of the fleet would be, the cost of maintaining wear and tear and depreciation in those vehicles per annum, 
it all will be it will be written off over the lifespan of a vehicle and it's probably different in terms of mileage in a rural uh, bus compared to an urban bus um, but I, I do think that you know okay. the, the idea of the looking at the lease not reducing them at the number of drivers not, that's not the point I'm making the point I'm making is that the, you know, the leasing of the fleet obviously potentially might have uh, some savings to the public purse. Yeah, well, uh, and the business case for the replacement programme is exactly the place that that should be, yeah. be done. So we'll come yeah. back Thanks. to you when Thank you. Thanks, okay. Thanks. 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 Members, can I just in encourage us to retain uh, quorum here if we can at all possible? We're very, very near the end of uh, today's meeting, but we've just got the remaining important uh, briefing on the Stroud Shared Education Campus and then just a very brief um, item of business for the committee as well. Uh, Karen and Catherine, you want to come in on this matter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just over and above, well, the, thank you for the presentation. Um, you've always been great to provide us with detail, but over and above, the list of schools have been put forward by, the man by their managing authorities. Does the department have a, de a detailed survey of the whole school stock um, and what is needed in relation to capital and maintenance? And then, has the department budged for more capital funding? Um, well, take the last question first. We've just been asked to put forward our um, capital requirements over the next three years, and it reflects what I have been raising there, that there is a significant uplift required over the next three years. So we've asked for that, and we'll, we'll wait to see what, what comes back. Um, there, there is a, a system that has, going back to your original question, a system that has a, a survey details on all of the, the, the schools, but at any point in time, um, you know, that, that, 1,100 schools or whatever it is, so there'll be some of those will be out of date. There's a, there's a cycle that, that goes on when the, the, the schools are surveyed. So when it comes to uh, major capital announcements or decisions on, on where funding's going, um, the reason we do what we do is, uh, and ask the managing authorities to, to forward a, a long list, is that uh, you know, we, we, we want to do up-to-date surveys on a limited number of schools uh, to allow us to do the assessment. So um, the answer is, to your question is yes, there is information, but a lot of it might be out of date across all 1,100 schools. And could you provide me after this with a breakdown by sector? of the number of schools operating in either temporary or not purpose-built facilities. Okay, I might have to think about the definition of that, but I'll come back to you and, and certainly we'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Catherine? Thanks, Philip. Um, I see there, Drumra Integrated College, um, which is in my constituency in West Tyrone. I see there um, it's a fresh start project and it's at stage one. I know Chris referred um, earlier to you know, the length, the time scale um, of some of these projects, but from a project at stage one to um, completion, how long would that generally or normally take? Well, that one should go more quickly because that one will not be a new build. Because yeah. the school, that will, I mean, I suppose I don't ever want to prejudge what the business case will say, but they're in relatively new uh, building and it's, a, it's a, an expansion issue. So that will most likely be uh, uh, an expansion of their existing on their existing site. The, the long delays are inclined to take place when uh, you start looking at site options, uh, assessing those site options, uh, getting planning for maybe sites that were not uh, designated as schools and so on. That project should move more quickly. I mean, I understand the consultant team should be appointed. And again, if you go to your little green list, there, there, there might be a date on it, but certainly over the next few months, all of those five that were announced, the, the procurements are well advanced. Um, at that point, if, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this, so uh, you can uh, take it as you wish, um, but the, the design element of that w would likely take a year to 18 months. Procurement of construction, another 18, or I'm sorry, another six months, and then construction after that. So, you know, it'll be the sort of three year time frame you'd be looking at on that one rather than the maybe seven years uh, where uh, a new site's required and a bigger, bigger scheme. Okay. Staying in West Tyrone, we'll move on to Stroh campus then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for your patience, John. Uh, obviously, an extremely important issue. So, very grateful for your presentation. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to brief you today. Um, 
In my role as Deputy Secretary for the Strewe Shared Education Campus Programme, I'm responsible for a number of strands, including the design, the procurement and the construction of the buildings, the education model, which is the development of a plan which is focused on the curriculum for the schools, the ownership, governance and management in respect of the day-to-day -day operation of the assets, the vacated sites working group, and ongoing stakeholder communications with schools and the local community. I'm just going to make a short opening statement then, which covers the totality of the, uh, the slides in, in your deck. Um, in terms of background, the, the school programme is a long-standing uh, priority of previous executives, and it's always received a broad political support. It's a significant shared education campus project, which will bring six schools and over 4,000 pupils from across the community onto a single campus to learn together on a vibrant and dynamic site. It involves significant capital investment in the west of Northern Ireland and should stimulate further development and regeneration, as well as promoting the benefits of shared education. In policy terms, the programme is a major contributor to the Together Building a United Community um, initiative and also the Education Minister's Shared Education Policy. And it's key to enhancing social inclusion, community development in the local area and beyond. And it will be the only campus here where special and mainstream schools will be co-located together. The executive inherited the site over a decade ago, and it was a working site which had been used by the military for well over 100 years. And as you would expect, it required a major amount of site clearance, decontamination and earthworks. And over the past six years, we've been working to totally transform the site to the state of readiness where it is today, where it's ready for the next phase of construction. Phase one was the design and construction of Arvely Special School, and that was completed in 2016, and the school opened in September of that year. We moved into phase two then, which has involved the demolition of over 300 buildings. The site has been cleared, decontaminated, and major earthworks have been carried out up to formation levels. And it's now ready for the next phase, which is to build the five post-primary schools and the shared facilities. The designs are complete to Royal Institute of British Architects stage three, and full planning permission has been obtained. A new road linking uh, the Strathroy Road across the River Strewl to the A5 opened in November 2019 and all told some £45 million has been invested to date. Turning to the main works procurement, um, the construction programme has faced major challenges over the past three years. Um, the main works competition which was launched in 2016 to appoint a contractor to build the five post-primary schools and shared facilities was suspended in February 2018 when one of the only two remaining bidders withdrew and that competition remains suspended today. It is live but it's, uh, it's suspended. At that time it was clear that the, uh, the costs of completing the, the, the programme would exceed the original business case approval so we undertook a review of uh, the construction programme and all the fundamental options, costs, benefits and risks. And that was a significant piece of work and we're continuing to work through the issues today. With a restoration of the political institutions, it falls to the Minister for Education to consider the options and take a decision on what to do next. Turning to other areas of the programme, um, the education model is being developed with senior leaders in the six schools together with input from the Department of Education and the Education Authority. And that really sets out the vision as to how shared education will be delivered on the campus, how the schools will work together to design a timetable which maximises the shared education potential in both the core schools and in the shared facilities. The department is also working with the schools on a range of innovative shared programmes and these have been de developed and led by the schools themselves and in doing so that will ensure that today's students 
will have the opportunity to play an important role in shaping the future of education, both locally and regionally. And many of those programmes are being led and developed by Arvalee Special School, which is uh, the school that is actually on site and up and running. The next project that we work on is um, the need to establish the detailed ownership, governance and management arrangements in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of the campus. Back in 2016, the four managing authorities on behalf of the six schools signed a memorandum of agreement which commits them to working together on these and other aspects of the campus. And areas that we are currently working on include how the shared areas will be run, development of a funding model um, for, the, for the shared facilities, and also we're looking at how facilities management might be delivered across the totality of the campus. <coughs> we're also conscious that a number of school sites will become vacant when the campus opens, and we set up the Vacated Sites Working Group in November 2016 to support the site owners and how they will plan for the disposal and reuse of their sites. And that group compri comprises members of the, uh, the site um, owners themselves, the local council, and several government departments. And we're actively considering how to best plan for and manage the future use of the sites. We've developed an overall disposal strategy as well as bespoke disposal strategies for each site, and those will be further developed in line with the Manor and Oma District Council Local Development Plan. So that's a brief overview of Struel and where, where we've got to at the moment. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, and for your time, and obviously happy to take questions. Okay, okay. thanks very much indeed, John. I, I suppose one of the main questions is obviously why the Struel campus has been so badly delayed. Um, what is the total overspend, and how much fresh start money will be allocated to Struel in total? Okay, um, first question, we, we, we released the, the competition for the main works to build the five schools and the shared facilities in late 2016 and we returned only two pre-qualification questionnaires and we'd expected to receive up to seven and that, would, that had been the indication from some pre-market engagement that we'd had with the industry before that. So there was less... Um, less interest than we expected. We released the invitation to tender in <coughs> January 2018 and pretty soon after that one of the two uh, consortia that were uh, had indicated that they were interested in, in bidding withdrew uh, citing issues connected to uh, the, um, the uh, political instability at the time and uh, unavailability of capital funding. Um, I took a decision pretty soon after that to suspend that competition while we assessed the options and, and took a way forward. And really that, that was the, the cause of the delay <coughs> initially. That competition remains suspended today and as I said uh, earlier on, it became clear that the, um, the costs of completing the construction would exceed the, uh, the amount that we had in the business case for a number of reasons. Um, the original business case was costed at 2015 prices and um, construction price inflation has been rising sharply uh, in <coughs> the UK and Ireland over, the, over that time. So that had an implication and the uh, ongoing costs of design development uh, had also um, had an impact. We'd faced a number of challenges on site. Uh, in terms of the site preparation works, which was a live contract at that time, and that was costing us more uh, than we anticipated. Um, and as a result, the, the costs have, have, have increased by about 27% over and above the original business case approval, which is about £40 million uh, at 2019 prices. Now, it's important to note that in doing the most up-to-date pretender estimate, We've also factored in the potential impacts of future price inflation from 2019 to campus completion in 2024 or thereabouts, and they were not included in the, in the original calculations. So what is the total uh, projected spend <coughs> for Stroke Campus? Total projected spend from, uh, from day one, which is about 2011 when we first started incurring some initial design fees, right through to completion 
is round about £215 million overall. Now that includes all of the historic expenditure on Arvali. Um, it includes site preparation works, the construction of the five um, post-primary schools and shared facilities, and it includes um, a provision for risk and inflation from now until campus completion. Obviously, if those risks and inflationary <coughs> pressures don't materialise, then that budget won't be spent. And is that good value for money? I think there are, there are many reasons to do the programme. Um, if we don't do the programme, we're simply delaying the time when those schools will need significant capital investment because not all of them are in the best state of repair. I think when you look at the non-monetary benefits of the programme, 4,000 pupils on one campus being educated together, and all the evidence shows that when you have sustained and meaningful contact time from people of different backgrounds, then educational uh, outcomes do improve. And I think the strength of this programme is in the, the, the community, education and societal benefits that um, it will deliver. Okay. Do you know what the total amount um, of Fresh Start uh, money that will be allocated? Is, is it all Fresh Start money or the £215 million? We were We have been funded primarily in the last couple of years through Fresh Start. Uh, two years ago, there was an announcement by the... Um, Secretary of State that Struhl would be eligible for up to 140 million of fresh start and that came as part of the confidence and supply deal and that covered the four years from 2018 to 2022. Now in the new decade new approach document there is an agreement that fresh start will be uh, afforded some flexibility and whilst the, the fine details on what that means for Struhl are still to be worked out. We would hope that within the totality of the Fresh Start um, funding envelope that Struhl will be funded from there. Okay, uh, Catherine, Kelly, you want to come in? Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, I think we're on the same page um, when we talk about the, the benefits of the Struhl Shared Education <coughs> Campus um, to the children, okay. the young people and the community. Um, I think it was maybe about a year ago or a year and a half ago that we were actually in as well um, on site and at that time the, the groundworks were still taking place but they were nearing um, completion um, and I'm glad to hear that they have um, completed their work at this time. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, the local community are uh, and ourselves hoping that the, that the project would have begun, that the next phase would have begun before now. Um, I did read somewhere um, in the documents that 2021 um, is the projected time for the next, to begin the next phase. Um, what I'm wondering is, is why so long um, if the Minister makes the decision now, um, why should it take so long for the next phase to begin? Once we, we have a decision to proceed, the, very, the, very, the next thing that we need to do is to move to appoint a contractor. Um, and that will take some time to, to do that. Um, in terms of the programme, we would need to be on site by May 2021 at the latest. If we can do it before that, we will do. Um, but if we can be on site working by May 21, then the campus could open in September 2024. <coughs> but for that to happen, we need decisions made on how we're going to proceed, and we need to um, conclude a procurement and appoint a contractor to take that forward. Is there any? Has there been any steps taken to to do that? Um, I know that. It's been sitting at that stage now for um, the last two years um, and we're, we've been well aware that um, the tendering process wasn't um, because there was only one contractor left. Um, has the decision been made to, to begin that process um, or, or when, will that, when will that begin? Is that up to the Minister? To the, the next decision in front of us is for the Minister to decide 
what to do in terms of the business case and the costs. Once we get that decision made, the very next thing that we will be addressing is how to take the procurement forward. We'll, we'll need to do that in sequence. Thank you. All right. John, can I just ask, if, if up to £140 million pounds of Fresh Start is uh, spent on Struil campus, the, if I'm not wrong, the total amount for Fresh Start is approximately £500 million. Is that, that right? Are, are we saying that potentially approximately a third of all Fresh Start money is going to be spent on the Struil Education campus? Well, that, that could be the case, yes. Um, obviously, Philip uh, side of the capital program will take up the uh, the significant majority of fresh start spend. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in, in truth, with that allocation and everything else that's already been um, announced, the, the the fresh start funding is effectively completely allocated. It's slightly over allocated. Okay. Right, what what's your assessment of the of the percentage of that that has gone towards? Albeit a shared project, is that is that a fair amount on one project? Is that more than you would have liked to have allocated to one project? Albeit the the significance of it. I suppose if the project is worth doing and the business case says it's worth doing, then uh, to some extent, where the funding come from comes from is is you know we, we we're not in the business I suppose of um, comparing. The benefits of one project against the other. Once once they're announced, we're our focus is on delivery. Okay, maybe something we can come back to. But um, if no other members, any questions? Thanks very much for your your patience, uh, uh, officials, for going through that. Obviously, a lot of those issues are issues that we'll come back to individual and focus briefings at a later date. But thank you so much for this first day thank briefing you. today. Look um, forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, there are a couple of items uh, from those briefings that to, we'll write to the department about. Um, Clark, are you happy to raise those to get agreement from the committee? Yep. So briefly then, members, there were like about 13 things. One, to write to the department to ask about the terms of reference for the Home to School Transport Review, including specifically about the question of mobile homes. Uh, secondly, about SEN and Irish Medium Schools, learning support units and learning specific tools. Uh, thirdly, the breakdown of the 10 million allocation for SEN. Fourthly, I think Mr Butler's question about the use of technology in shared education. Members, can I just raise quickly, if the 10 million allocation to SEN, if the answer is going to be it's for the Education Authority to allocate that, can we request that we get the breakdown from the Education Authority yeah. then? Yeah, okay. okay. No problem. Um, so fifthly then, uh, I think we're looking for sight of the 2017 uh, report from the group ta about tackling disadvantage. Um, uh, sixth one then was, um, I think the committee <coughs> might wish to write to the department to ask what it plans to do in terms <coughs> of resolving anomalies in respect of post-primary transfer. I think it was something about mm -hmm. that. I okay. don't know if they actually got answered. Um, the next one was uh, just information from the department about support for schools with legacy deficits. What's their plan? Because they did kind of answer there. And then uh, from the Education Authority about its use of the contingency fund uh, for this year. So they're coming next week anyway, so that'll be a heads up for them. Perhaps, members, you might like to seek um, the details from the department about its plans for spending Fresh Start. As Philip just indicated at the end, they seem to believe they're going to get it all spent. I think that refers to the 250 million that's left. I think that's what they mean, but I don't know. Yeah, so agreed. Shall we find out? Yeah, agreed. Okay. Uh, then there's the question, uh, I think, to the department about the Education Authority's bus fleet and have they considered leasing as part of their business case? Happy enough for that, yeah, agreed. Then, nearly there, uh, I think we're asking about uh, uh, school enhancement programme number two, Trosh 4. Is there one? Yep. And then uh, we're seeking a breakdown by sector of schools which are in temporary uh, accommodation. And then uh, perhaps the committee may wish to write to the minister seeking the next steps for Struel, because I think that's what John Smith mm. just said. It's down to the minister. Is this money okay? Can we go ahead with the... Um, Agreed. That, if that's okay then, members, Agreed. that's brilliant. Okay. Members, we just have correspondence and forward work programme to finish here. It should take us a couple of minutes. Just appreciate your patience. Um, 
So agenda item 7, correspondence. Uh, I'll refer members to tab 6, pages 108 to 120. We have seven items of correspondence and a summary note is included at item 7.1 of page 108. Are members content to follow the suggested approach in the index note for correspondence items with the exception of the following items that the clerk will speak to? So, Chair, there's a, at 7.3, which is uh, on page 112, there's a, an email from the department to the chairperson inviting him to take part in an interview as part of a gateway review. Just suggest we park this for now because the department's actually written a formal letter about it and conscious that we're practically on our quorum. So we'll put that aside for another day if that's okay, Chair. Okay, so great. Yep. And then the other one was at 7.7, .7, which is page 120. The transfers representative council had asked to meet with the chairperson. Not unusual. Just is the committee content, Chairperson, for for you to meet with them as chairperson? And that yeah, I'm I'm content for any members to join me to attend that meeting as well. So yeah, I suppose content agree for me to meet them and if anybody wants to join me, welcome to do so as well. Content, yeah. Agreed, okay. I think and everything else is just noting um so it's okay. a late day for the Agenda item eight then, Ford Work Program. Um, okay, ask the clerk to speak uh, to our Ford Work Programme. So, Chairperson, um, as was mentioned in the uh, earlier session, um, the Department had previously referred to an emotional health and wellbeing framework, um, and uh, what the committee wanted to do was have a joint meeting, meeting with our colleagues in the Committee for Health about this on, I think, the 12th of February, and I've chatted to the clerk. They haven't actually formally considered this yet at the Committee for Health because they meet on a Thursday. Um, but uh, what they've advised me is um, that in line with standing orders, uh, they anticipate that there shouldn't be a problem with the Education Committee on its own, um, taking evidence from DE, Department of Health, Health and Social Care Board, uh, Public Health Agency, on the 12th of February on this issue of the framework. And then the suggestion being that when the Mental Health Action Plan, which is to be published within two months, when that appears, um, that might be um, an appropriate moment for there to be a joint committee meeting to talk about the uh, education, health, uh, sorry, education and health aspects of that. So if members are content with that approach, so we'll just have the four sets of officials at the end. Yeah. I'll then arrange a um, stakeholder uh, meeting after that, once we've heard a little bit about the framework, and uh, once we've kind of got members up to speed a bit, uh, then we could have a joint committee meeting, and that could then inform the committee's response to this uh, new mental health action plan, which I presume is going to include things about suicide awareness, resilience, and all those uh, important matters that, that members have mentioned so I think intent. I think there's an urgency to this and if it doesn't quite work to do the joint session at this stage we should proceed our members yeah. content yes yeah yeah brilliant chairperson Justin, forgive me Justin yet who is delivering the mental health action plan just uh, there's there was an announcement uh, this day last week there seems to be a cross departmental group yeah. but there'll be obviously there'll be health things in it and there'll be education things in it so quite logically uh, I think the suggestion is that the Committee for Health, Committee for Education gets together, has a joint meeting and reviews that um, major piece of work uh, when it emerges in two months' time, which is not too far away. It'll be before Easter. So I'm hoping that before then, number one, we'd have the emotional health and wellbeing framework under our belts. And we could also have a, a stakeholder meeting as well. So when you then see the Mental Health Action Plan, you know, you'll, you'll feel up to speed with it and be able to, to challenge or improve it. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, okay. The other one, Chairperson, sorry, was that um, members wanted, and rightly so, a uh, closed strategic planning session also on the 12th of February. I'm wondering, Chairperson, if you could put that off a couple of weeks. There was a stack of stuff that came out of the departments in terms of their first day brief, uh, and the Permanent Secretary just offered us a briefing on underachievements and uh, PISA, and that's, I'm thinking maybe we could put that in on the 12th. Mm -hmm. So you've got your joint, uh, sorry, not the joint session, but you have the emotional health and well-being, and maybe we could try and get them to come up and talk to us about um, uh, PISA and such like, and then give okay. that I'm, a week or two. I'm, I'm, key, I'm, I'm eager to stick to my proposal that we have individual themes per session. I realise we went way over time today. Um, I think it's fairly unique in that you're getting the Minister and the senior officials. 
I will endeavour not to make that a uh, pattern. Um, but could we could we maybe um, discuss um, whether we retain at, at the moment today was ministers and officials. Next week is going to be education authority. The week after that, the theme would be emotional health and well-being. Um, I think under educational attainment um, is a theme in itself for a uh, for a week for itself. Um, maybe we think whether we invite um, other organisations, small in number, um, to that Wednesday session. If we do think there'll be a slight more amount of time on it, I'm also eager to do the strategic planning session as soon as we can, rather than later. Um, is it are members content for Clark and I just to have a discussion about yeah. this and then to come back to you? Are you, are you okay. content with that? Clark? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, are members content with the the direction of travel to try and keep the committee? I realize we've got a lot to get through, but I think if we can keep them on particular themes, it would mm -hmm. focus us in on that yeah. theme and then deal with, you know, another theme on another free day. Mm -hmm. Um so we we'll we'll come back to you about whether or not to replace the strategic planning aspect of the 12th of February, yeah. And just Ted notice, Clark, yeah. Not in front of me, that uh, we'd planned an, the informal lunchtime meeting on wellbeing and emotional health for the 11th. That's a bit early for us, if we can put that off. Change that. If that's okay, members are agreed, Chairperson. Yeah, and that's probably better after the session that we've had with yeah. the department that day. Exactly. Okay. Okay, any other forward work programme? That should be good. Matters, Clark? No, okay. That's great. Uh, uh, agenda item 9 then, members, is any other business? Members have any other business they'd like to see?